Um, good morning, everyone. Um, nice to see you all today. So, my name is Emma Johnson, and I'm an analyst in the safety policy division, um, and I'll be facilitating parts of this workshop. So, this is a workshop for R2110. 001, which is the order instituting rulemaking to develop safety culture assessments for electric and natural gas utilities. This workshop is being recorded, um, as you might have just heard. Um, so we're going to start with just a welcome and some housekeeping notes and some opening comments from our assigned commissioner, Houck. Um, so the, this proceeding was opened in October of 2021. To date, we've received opening and reply comments on the workshop. Um, and then today <laughs> is our kickoff workshop, um, which is just our like beginning educational workshop to get people on the same page and to share some um, information about safety culture assessments from some experts. Um, we plan to have additional technical working group meetings in the summer and fall of 2021, all working towards the goal of the proceeding which is to develop a safety, uh, develop and adopt a safety culture assessment framework and process for regulated electric, regulated investor owned electric and natural gas utilities and gas storage operators. Um, so this is just a high level overview of our agenda for today. Um, after we do our opening, we're gonna do some, here's some presentation, five different presentations from some experts, and then we're gonna move on to a more open discussion and question and answer session. And here's a detailed agenda. I'll just pause here so that you all can see, um, see that really quickly. And then finally, we have some virtual housekeeping notes. Um, so for, for questions from the audience, um, there's an option to just type questions into the chat. Um, or to press the three little dots in the bottom right of your WebEx screen and um, use the question and answer function that's built into WebEx. Either is fine with us, so whatever is easiest, easiest for you. Um, staff will try to resolve questions as they're received um, or assign them to the appropriate person that they're directed to. We'll also have that question and answer session at the end um, where we can pull out questions from, from the chat that were asked and not resolved. Um, for timing, we have a, a pretty packed agenda today for our three hours. Um, so to remain uh, respectful of people's time, we're gonna try and start presentations at the times that were indicated in the agenda. Um, we will note that the recording and the slides will be sent and distributed after the workshop in case um, you miss any part of this workshop today. Um, and then finally, if you see chat messages from Brevin or Jorge, um, those, those are our IT people assigned to this um, webinar, so they'll be able to help you if you're having any issues today. Um, and I was just gonna pause to see if there were any like technical questions from, from the audience this morning. and I'm not seeing any. Um, so we're gonna move on to, um, I'm gonna pass it on to Commissioner House, and if you have any opening comments, um, you can kick, kick us off with those. Thank you, Emma. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us today for this workshop, and um, as Emma said, rulemaking 2110-001. I appreciate everyone's participation and look forward to hearing your viewpoints and furthering this important conversation. I want to thank um, Administrative Law Judge Rizzo, Ben Turner, Saeed Bagri, Emma Johnston, and Carolina Contreras of the Safety Policy Division for their work on this proceeding and organizing today's workshop. I'd like to thank our panelists for their participation and for sharing their expertise on safety culture and our IT staff for keeping us all connected. We could not do this work in a virtual environment without them. Um, the purpose of this rulemaking is to develop a safety culture assessment framework and processes that improve the organization-wide safety culture of the electric and gas investor-owned utilities regulated by the California Public Utilities Commission. 
With this proceeding, we intend to provide guidance on the form and content of the investor owned utility safety culture assessments, a venue for review of organizational safety culture and determine a process for ongoing review of safety culture assessments in future years. Today's presentations and discussion will assist in setting the stage for the work ahead on these important issues. And again, I'm looking forward to hearing from everyone and exploring how we can use the principles presented today to improve the safety outcomes of our electric and natural gas regulated utilities. Um, I'll turn it back to Emma. I know we're a little ahead of schedule actually, usually it's the other way around. Um, I think Commissioner Rechtschaffen was hoping to have been here today, but he had another conflict um, that required him to be somewhere else. But I am looking forward um, to hearing from everyone and um, the work in this really important proceeding. So I'll turn it back over to Emma. Thank you, Commissioner. Yeah, so uh, as Commissioner said, we are a little bit ahead of schedule. Um, so hopefully we'll be able to build in a break at some point during the presentations just so that people can have a quick stretch, uh, stretch, ba stretch break. Um, so, um, we're going to move on to our speaker presentation and here's a list again of all the speakers that will be presenting. Um, okay, so our 1st presenter is Dr. Mark Fleming. Dr. Fleming is a professor in the department of psychology at St. Mary's university. Um, and he has. He's an applied psychologist with nearly 30 years of experience working to enhance safety culture in a range of different industries, including offshore oil and gas, nuclear power, petrochemical power generation and construction. Um, he advises regulators and large organizations on safety culture assessment and improvement um, and is dedicated to developing practical and valid tools to assist organizations to prevent harm. And I'm going to pass the stop sharing my screen and pass the presenter role on to you. Hi everyone, um, I'm just going to see that. Great. Um, so thanks, uh, thanks very much uh, for inviting me here to um, uh, to share my my thoughts around uh, safety culture. Um, as Emma mentioned, I've been working on safety culture for uh, over thirty years, and uh, I'm pleased to uh, say that I know many of the panelists uh, who were presenting, although some I haven't seen for for a couple of years. Um, so uh, I'm going to talk about uh, for about twenty minutes about uh, safety culture. So I'm going to give uh, some overviews um, of uh, safety culture. I'm going to talk about safety culture and disasters. And then I'm going to finish up uh, by talking um, on safety culture and measurement. Um, and the purpose of this talk is just to give people some sort of uh, different perspectives on ways of viewing safety culture. So uh, safety culture began um, the, following the, the Chernobyl disaster uh, in uh, the Ukraine in the former Soviet Union. And, um, you know, after that was the, at that point in time, was the largest uh, nuclear disaster still has been uh, and caused a huge amount of radiation to be released and resulted in a, a large international inquiry into um, the disaster. And the, it's hard maybe to remember for everyone back then, it's over 30 years ago, but, you know, the Chernobyl was in the former Soviet Union and we only found out about it in the West uh, because in, in Sweden, their alarms, their radiation alarms outside the nuclear power plant went off when they were trying to work out where the radiation was coming from and eventually realized it happened in the former Soviet Union. So to begin with, there was no announcement of it. And there was a lot of political sort of um, wrangling going on between the West and the former Soviet Union. And because the IAEA is an international body, a UN agency, the public report and the report into the, the disaster was somewhat politicized and, and challenging. And one of the uh, things that the Western governments wanted to put in the report was that the disaster was caused by the Soviet culture. And uh, well, that wasn't going to fly because obviously lots of communist countries didn't necessarily want to support that. So the um, Compromise was to call it safety culture, right? So, um, really, 
safety culture was used in the in in it was originally coined really as as a sort of political expediency. It was made up just because uh, it was able to to get things that people could agree on in terms of in terms of their report. So it really sort of started off from a from a term perspective as being something that um, was ambiguous enough that people uh, could agree to in a political um, context. Um, and ironically, it's now a globally recognized, although poorly defined term and a major area of practice. So we have Chernobyl to sort of thank uh, for the concept of safety culture, or at least the term safety culture. The research um, in some ways, um, there have been previous work in um, normal accident theory by Perrow in the States and uh, the work of uh, um, Nick Turner in, in the UK had already been sort of talking about uh, cultural causes of disasters. So there was some, some conceptual work already existed. Although when you read the um, a report into Chernobyl, they don't draw on this uh, information at all. Um, so in some ways, um, you know, safety culture really didn't start off as being something that was likely to turn into what it what it ended up uh, turning into in practice. So uh, for me, uh, as I mentioned, uh, I've been working in safety culture for approaching 30 years now. Um, and when I, I did my undergraduate degree in uh, Aberdeen in Scotland, and uh, in Aberdeen, you couldn't ha live there, but but be impacted in some shape or form by uh, the Piper Alpha disaster that happened in July 1988, 167 people died on an offshore platform. It's the worst offshore disaster uh, in history. And that um, public inquiry and, and the impact of Piper was really what sort of started me on my safety journey. So my undergraduate degree is in psychology, so it's not really uh, directly related to safety, but um, when I first learned about and listened to the, a, a sort of presentation about Piper um, as a sort of 22, 23 year old, I sat there listening and thinking, you know, these guys don't know what they're talking about, uh, these engineers. This is fundamentally a psychological issue, not an engineering issue. And I've sort of stuck to that perspective for some time that really safety and, and a pretty high hazard is more psychological than it is often engineering. And that's mainly, I think, because we maybe have better engineering strategies than we do psychological ones. So Piper is what got me in, involved in safety and, and it was um, partially due to the culture of Occidental Petroleum, the operator of the rig um, and uh, the public inquiry by Lord Cullen identified many of the cultural issues that contributed to that disaster. And I came actually from, from Scotland to Canada in 2001 to take up a job here at St. Mary's. And really when I arrived in North America, no one was really talking about safety culture, it seemed like safety culture um, uh, until the, uh, was not an issue in, in North America, it wasn't a topic that really was much conversation. Uh, that changed with the uh, Texas City explosion, uh, the BP refinery, and that really got safety culture on the uh, agenda for people in North America. So um, after that disaster, people were more interested in the research I was doing uh, than they had been in, in previous uh, years. So there, there's a lot more interest in safety culture after um, the Texas City explosion, um, mainly because of the Baker report that highlighted the culture both within BP and also um, uh, in the petrochemical industry in general in, uh, in North America as being something that needed to be addressed. And interestingly, one of the big conclusions out of the BP Texas City report was using um, lost time injuries as an indicator of overall safety is a serious error. Um, and then uh, 2011, we have uh, Deepwater Horizon uh, in uh, the Gulf of Mexico. Again, um, uh, Transocean rig on contract to BP. Again, another exhaustive uh, government report investigating it, which also identified the culture um, as being a contributory factor. And that disaster, again, you know, there was a lot of um, sort of criticism of BP of having a, a poor safety culture. Um, it's my understanding that the BP executive took exception to this because they had questionnaire data that said that they had a great safety culture on uh, the border horizon. And I think this again is going to be something I come to later when we talk about uh, measurement is that uh, sometimes we can, we can end up getting a false sense of security uh, with these assessments. So um, uh, then uh, we have uh, San Bruno uh, in California again similarly identified cultural issues with PG&E. Um, and then we've also had uh, the uh, incident in um, 
in Japan, Fukushima, and in Canada, we've had uh, Black Big Antique, where a uh, railway um, laden with fuel um, uh, lost control and uh, ended up in a, in a town and killed 49 people. And I spend um, a lot of my time looking at disaster reports and reviewing them. And, you know, what's depressing is that they're all pretty similar and they all have very similar issues um, that they um, identified. And this actually was summed up nicely by Terry Lee in, in the late 90s, where he said, despite the adoption of full range of safety arrangements, complex systems broke down disastrous, disastrously because the people running them failed to do what they were supposed to do. They were not simple individual errors, but malpractices that corrupted the social system and organizational functioning. So what's common across all these events is that the systems that they operated didn't work as intended. These were not unknown hazards that people could not have anticipated. These were all things that were known and there were always processes in place that should have prevented them from occurring, except those controls were not in place at the time. And it's not to say that people made mistakes. There was lots of mistakes. Blaming one individual or even a small group of individuals is not particularly helpful because these were really a breakdown in the social system, in the cultural understanding about what was important and why things happened. So uh, if we're trying to understand to prevent disasters, we need to look at uh, these uh, organizational factors, these cultural factors that make them most likely. Um, and you know, if we think about the executives in, in BP who are operating the, um, the, the Transocean rig, I'm very confident that they did not believe that they were going to have a major failure. It's not that they didn't do things and it's not to, to remove them from responsibility, but they believed that they were safe. And that's going to be a major challenge um, as we go forward in terms of what we're talking about here. We're not talking about companies who don't care about safety. It's that they have a fundamental misunderstanding of how well their systems are functioning and also what the nature of safety is. So safety culture, um, as I mentioned before, uh, is an abstract construct, construct that we was created to describe a failure to implement con known controls to prevent catastrophic events. So we created this idea of safety culture or this concept of safety culture to explain why these events happen to particularly to companies who often have very sophisticated, sophisticated control systems that should have been in place to prevent the disaster. The disasters were predicated or, or preceded by a period of time where often these organizations felt that they were very effective and very good at managing safety, not necessarily anticipating a disaster. It wasn't people who thought this will, this is that we don't care if this happens. They all probably did care, would want to have prevented it, but didn't necessarily know how well their systems were operating. And I think another thing that's important when we think about the construct of safety culture is that it is really related to major hazard risk rather than occupational safety. So I know in many industries, they like to talk about safety culture when it's to do with occupational safety, but actually the concept itself, uh, when it was coined from Chernobyl, the concept that, that preceded it uh, with Barry, Barry Turner's work on um, man-made uh, disasters, these were very much um, uh, talking about major hazard risk. And from my perspective, although I'm, I'm sort of pretty confident people will disagree with me, it would be more useful to use the term safety climate when we're referring to occupational safety and safety culture when we're talking about major hazard risk. And when we look at the literature on safety climate, all of the work really is associated with occupational injury. And we should be able to then focus on safety culture as being this broader construct around um, uh, managing hazards uh, in that sort of context. So I'm just going to put up some definitions. I'm not really going to dwell on them, um, but there are a, a range of definitions around there uh, on, on safety culture. And it's sort of pretty depressing to me for someone who's been around this for a long time to see more definitions coming out a year after year. It's very unhelpful at this stage. Um, you know, the, so the, the one that I tend to like is, is the Axini one, which uh, sort of highlights the, the, the uh, nature and commitment to um, health and safety management. 
um, that determines the effectiveness of our preventative measures, which I think is quite a good one. But there's, there are all of these uh, definitions are, are perfectly acceptable. And, you know, you just have to pick one and uh, see what works, but they have a number of common themes. So what's important about culture is that it's something that people share, right? It is a, a shared construct. It's at an organizational rather than an individual level. So saying that someone has a poor safety culture doesn't make any sense, right? It's not, uh, it's not about the individual. It's about the thing that we have in common. It's multifaceted and complex, and, and then by that we mean that there's many different aspects to it and many different components that go to make up an organization's safety culture, because it's about how we think and feel and view um, uh, safety within the organization. Um, it includes values, attitudes, beliefs, norms, practices related to risk and safety, and it influences how we manage risk within the organization. So it's that much that shared idea about um, about safety and and how it's managed, and probably more importantly, and a piece that's often uh, missed, I think sometimes, is that the safety culture determines what we mean by the term safety. Right, um, that means very different things to different people. The actual idea of safety. So in some organisations, when you say the word safety, they immediately think about slips, trips, and falls. Um, in other organizations, it has a, it has a broader uh, understanding among people. So it's important to, to recognize that the culture um, has a, a broad uh, impact on uh, how we how we behave and how we think about um, safety. So um, this is a model um, uh, it's originally uh, presented by uh, the NEB, uh, the CER. And uh, Claudine Bradley will be able to probably speak to this more than than myself, but I think this is a great uh, model. It's based on work of James Reason, um, where really it talks about a couple of things. One is that culture, uh, James Reason describes as being the only thing that is uh, is, is one of the one of the factors that can um, uh, impact all layers of defenses: your your technical, your organization, and your human de your human defenses. So it's the ultimate sort of common error mode. Um, failure. So it, it's, it is problematic because it attacks all aspects of your safety management system. And um, these threats that are present in all organizations are the things that we should be alert to and the things we should be trying to manage and prevent. Um, so production pressure or cost versus safety um, can undermine your safety systems where you compromise um, the, the safety of the organization so that um, you can uh, get things done. Uh, safety, at least in the short term, costs money. So there's always a trade off between um, working safety and, um, and uh, managing risk. Complacency is another uh, sort of uh, factor that can undermine our safety systems. And complacency comes in two forms. There's one form, which is I don't care about safety, uh, which is rare in, in, in pipeline industries in general. Uh, sa safety critical industries generally, they don't have that type of complacency. But they have the other kind, which is it's never going to happen to us. Um, and maybe a better term would be invulnerability, where you feel that you're so good at this, you don't need to, you're, you're not going to have a problem. And it also allows you to maybe do things slightly differently and, and ignore rules um, that apply to others. And we can, we've definitely seen examples of this. Um, and if anyone's watched the Netflix uh, documentary on a downfall, you can see where um, Boeing maybe had some of this idea that we're so safe, we don't need to worry about it. One of the most terrifying words that I hear senior leaders say occasionally is safety is a given. Uh, that is the stupidest thing a senior leader should ever say. Uh, it's never a given, it's an active process. And that gives you a sense of this complacency of invulnerability. Um, Normalization of deviance, slightly complicated way of saying that it's become normal for people to break the rules and uh, they don't even realize that they are breaking them anymore, that it's just, the, it's just the way we do things in this context. And when you point out that they're breaking the rules, they maybe know it, but they don't necessarily uh, think it is wrong in that sense. Uh, this, this posted, driving over the posted speed limit by 10% would be an example of this. It's a typically accepted practice, although it is actually breaking the rules and increasing risk. And then the last one, tolerance and inadequate systems is where you just come to accept that the systems that you're operating don't actually work and that you have, to have workarounds all the time. And this always in, in, introduces uh, risk into the system. So all of these threats, they're present to a certain degree in all organizations. Therefore, organizations should be trying to be aware of the extent to which they're present and the amount of risk that they're bringing in and how they're actively uh, managing them. 
So one of the things that I find um, a little bit depressing sometimes in my work is that you um, end up with uh, trying to help organizations manage uh, risk and they're not willing to look at the negative aspects of safety culture. They're only willing to talk about the positive stuff. Uh, we did a, a, a study where we looked at offshore disasters and we identified the, that these um, there were indicators of, of these cultural threats present uh, in these events. Right, so tolerance of adequate systems was the most common um, and actually work pressure cost was actually identified only four times uh, in the public inquiry reports that we, we investigated. So, I think regulators um, really should be focused on understanding, uh, first of all, that, that safety culture is complex and how it influences risk. They should be able to see if they can identify the warning signs or at least get the duty holders to be able to um, uh, identify these threats that are present within their business and then influence their, their the duty holders to address their safety culture. So that's the, the regulatory challenge. Um, I want to sort of, sort of talk a little bit about that measurement issues. So first of all, um, safety culture is uh, an abstract construct. We made it up. It's not real. Um, and in that sense, you can't really measure it. Um, you can assess it, you can understand it, but measurement is, is, is not, not correct. And just to give you a sort of another sort of metaphor for that, you know, love is a construct that we have made up uh, as a society. And we can't measure that either. It doesn't mean it's not important, but it's, it's just that because it's an abstract construct, it's not something that lends itself to precision and measurement uh, in the way that other things other things do. Um, so I think that's the thing to think about in terms of, of uh, safety culture. We can conduct an assessment exercise to gain a greater un understanding, greater insight into these uh, cultural factors that are influencing our safety systems. But I think we need to be careful about the extent to which we're really measuring uh, that concept. Also, it's an overused term. You know, if you search safety culture um, in, into Google, you get an endless set of advertisements, advertising everything from, from you know, protective driving courses to just about anything uh, is going to be sold with the concept of safety culture. So it's definitely way overused. And most people who are most, the people who are most excited about the term, in my mind, don't understand it. Um, there's a wide range of, of approaches and perspectives um, that I think um, is not in itself a bad thing. Um, as long as as people can appreciate the 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 extent to which where this where this construct came from and what it's really trying to achieve, it has overlaps with other constructs. Um, although I think it would be more useful if we use safety climate to refer to occupational safety. Um, and probably the most important thing is that there's incentives for many stakeholders to claim to be measuring safety culture, even if they're not doing a particularly good job. Um, and that, I think, is one of the bigger challenges in this space is that it's um, oversold. Um, so interruption, Dr. Fleming, that you probably yeah. have only one minute left. Okay, great. Um, so I'm going to skip that one. So I think the, the thing that is a challenge is uh, for uh, people is to avoid this illusion of objectivity. Numbers, are, at least in this context, are not necessarily objective. Um, you kind of artifacts that you look at and think that that's really a good indicator of safety culture, but um, often they can be deceptive. And I would uh, remind you of Goodard's law, when a measure becomes a target, it ceases to be a good measure. And I think that's important to think about when we talk about uh, assessing and understanding safety culture. So in summary, safety culture is not real, yet it's important. You need to avoid simplistic approaches to, to safety culture and be aware of the delusion of objectivity. Um, I think it's incumbent on people in this uh, industry to develop a sophisticated understanding of safety culture and not accept simplistic views and seek ways to identify the presence of safety culture threats. Thanks very much. Um, thank you, Dr. Fleming. Uh, next up, we're going to have um, Paul, sorry, I forgot my video isn't on. We're going to have Paul Shulman. Um, so, Dr. Shulman is a professor uh, emeritus of government at Mills College in Oakland and a senior research associate at the Center for Catastrophic Risk Management at, the, at UC Berkeley. He has written extensively on managing hazardous technical systems to high levels 
of reliability and safety and has served as a consultant to the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission, the California Independent System o Operator, and the Lawrence L Livermore National Laboratory. He was also an advisor to the CPC's Office of the Safety Advocate, which pre was the predecessor to the Safety Pol Policy Division. And I will share my screen. And I will pick it off to you, Paul. Okay, <clears throat> thank you, Mark. That was such a great presentation. It's, it actually helps me a lot in um, not having to do some things in my presentation. Uh, so um, I guess you are, do I need to share my screen for you to see what I'm doing? Um, I, can, I can share my, I have my screen, your presentation up well, here. Well, let me try this and see if it works for me. Um, There is that you can see that. Uh, I, I would have to stop stop. Uh, so you, I'm not sharing my screen in other words. Uh, I don't think so, oh. but I, if it works for you, I can also just move your slides for you and share your presentation. Okay. Yeah. If you put it up, then that that'll work. Okay, great. So uh, you can move to um, number three, if you would. There. Um, so uh, I think Mark has given you definitions and uh, I think that's very helpful. I just want to uh, start by suggesting that there is a foundation, actually a common foundation in many respects for uh, safety cultures, the evolution of what we call safety cultures. Um, and that foundation is a set of assumptions, or in another way to put it is it's a shared conception of what safety is. Uh, and that has to be widely shared in an organization. And the concept is that safety is simply more than the absence of harmful events and the failure of things to go wrong. Um, in my work, I and a colleague have talked about the uh, idea that somehow people don't know how to distinguish a actual safety culture from what we would call the failure to fail. Many organizations are simply failing to fail. Uh, so they have good safe, what look like good safety records, um, partly because the, things haven't caught up with them. And the, always the risk is that an organization is failing to fail will ultimately fail to fail to fail and then, and then succeed in having an accident. God, did I actually say it that way? I'm sorry. But in any case, um, there's another conception of safety that instead of that, that I think is more likely to be seen in um, organizations that have good safety culture. It's, that is that safety is a set of design and practice-based processes that produce successful outcomes with respect to safety. The best way I've heard it um, offered is by the psychologist Carl Weick. Safety is the continuous production of dynamic non-events. Um, that stresses the importance of continual attention to conditions, um, precursor conditions that can lead to failure, um, including indicators of that a precursor zone that they want to stay out of in operations, and the integrity of these dynamic processes, not simply assuming that an interval without accidents and failures is a confirmation of safety. Until that is a widely shared perspective of what safety is. Um, then I think you have a very weak foundation to have something that we would call a safety culture. In the organizations we've talked to that have decent operating records and a good safety foundation, to them, they are only as safe as the first accident and how out ahead of them. Um, next slide, please. Another foundational conception is that safety is um, perceived not simply as uh, the mitigation of risk. There's a wonderful statement that came out from a group of aviation safety management um, people from 18 different national regulators, aviation regulators. Safety is more than the absence of risk. It requires specific systemic enablers of safety to be maintained at all times 
to cope with the known risks and to be well prepared to cope with those risks that are not yet known and to address the natural erosion of risk controls over time. This is a very insightful uh, conception, I think, of safety. And one of the key things is the idea that there is a natural erosion of risk controls. Safety is not once and for all installed in an organization. Um, and what, what we would call a safety cult culture is perishable. And a good safety culture always takes its own temperature. And part of the precursors that it looks for are things that reflect the erosion of um, the safety culture and the assumptions, the shared assumptions that underlie it. Next slide, please. So, um, right, here are elements of a safety culture. Um, they are um, elements that actually there is more or less of a consensus evolving. Um, some of these are the result of work by the Institute of Nuclear Power Operators and modifications by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Um, these are elements that are widely um, accepted and identified with a safety culture, leadership commitment to safety values, problem identification, personal responsibility for safety, embedded in work processes, continuous learning, an environment for raising concerns, and effective um, safety communication across tasks and levels in an organization, respectful work at it in environment, questioning attitude, and decision-making that is systematic, rigorous, and thorough. There's a hidden design in this, in these elements. The hidden design in this is that these elements, many of them, can promote a strategy of the suppression of cognitive errors as a key to safe operation of hazardous systems. Safety culture reflects, as one of its values, an aversion to errors of misperception, misestimation, and misspecification in decisions and actions. Suppressing these cognitive misunderstandings is a foundation for high cognitive reliability in management processes, which in turn is a foundation for safety. Next slide, please. So um, then the question is, What's the role of safety culture in affecting organizational behavior and safety outputs? First, I would say, as Mark has really hinted at, safety culture is less a noun, less that some organization has than an adverb. It refers as a modifier to how things are done safely in the process of producing outputs while preventing accidents. Uh, and it's a background condition. One of the things it does is it provides motivation for specific safety promoting behaviors and the reliability of those behaviors. It is a way to support social norms over market norms. Um, a lot of cognitive psychology experiments have actually demonstrated that there's a major difference between how people think about social norms related to collective duties and responsibilities larger than themselves versus how they think about market and economic transactions and their individual interests in relation to them. And interestingly enough, these two modes of thinking cannot easily be added to one another as motivational enhancers. One, basically, market norms often erode social norms. We'll talk more about that uh, as we go. Um, it also, uh, safety culture is a background condition that sets constraints on individual and collective um, decisions, restraints with respect to prudence, risk, um, and uncertainty. Thirdly, stabilize, uh, a safety culture um, can stabilize expectations about the behavior of others. It can be a cognitive simplifier for social interactions in an organization. You can trust the motivations and the likely behaviors of others who share the same set of assumptions as part of a shared culture. You don't have to worry about what will happen if you raise concerns, for example. You actually can focus and more sharply on work when you don't have to worry about how people are going to behave and anticipating it. So all of those are indirect conditions that a safety culture can add to enhance safety. Next slide, please. At the same time, safety culture is a concept that poses real difficulties for managers and regulators. As Mark has noted, it's an abstract and intangible process that can be hard to measure, to assess, and to control. 
Safety has culture, as he noted, also has become a fad for the marketing of ma management prescriptions. You go to the internet, you will see the three, five, eight, or nine basic and easy steps to a safety culture. The ambiguity of a concept can also allow for a quick explanation of failure and accident and the blanket condemnation of an organization in which it occurs, that accident. So you say it has a rotten safety culture. That's the explanation. That has a condemnatory uh, halo, puts it one, around the organization in which it occurs. Then if a regulator wants to do safety culture assessments conducted after these accidents, those assessments are likely to be subject to distortion through hindsight bias. Oh, everybody knows it's got a rotten culture. Let's go see exactly how. The concept also can generate external prosecution of organizations or their executives in the aftermath of accidents as legally accountable for the failure to develop a stronger safety culture. Next slide, please. What safety outcome or metrics should be used by a regulator if it's assessing safety culture to evaluate the efficacy of its safety culture assessment processes. I would say the efficacy of a safety culture assessment process must ultimately be in the successful development and maintenance of a mature safety culture within a regulated utility, not its role as a foundation for detecting its failures and imposing punishments. Next slide, please. There are real challenges, unfortunately, in the process of safety culture development. People think it's easy. It is not at all easy. First, all organizations will already have a culture. They like the subcultures in specialized units and departments. The major challenge in promoting a safety culture in an organization may well lie in the prior existence of a culture or subcultures that have elements antagonistic to those of the safety cultures. Um, the definition of culture is that it is a set of assumptions and practices that have worked well enough in people's minds to be transmitted to others. Well, those prior safety culture elements have seen, have been seen to work well enough to practitioners of them in subcultures, in, in units of the organization or the whole organization. It's not going to be easy to dislodge those prior elements of culture. It may take an uncertain time, even a new generation of managers for safety culture to displace or successfully modify prior cultures. Also, it's important to recognize in trying to develop a safety culture, there are costs to organizations in adopting a safety culture. It may cost them speed or efficiency or undermine what they consider to be decisive leadership because it puts constraints on decisions by leaders. It may undermine other goals in production output or capacity. And thirdly, it may undermine the effectiveness of an organization against its competitors who don't have safety culture. Next slide, please. Um, so there are these uncertainties in safety culture development that regulators have to recognize. A safety culture can be a long, unpredictable, and uncertain journey. This was the conclusion of the National Academy of Sciences group studying uh, safety culture in the offshore oil and gas industry. We do not know or have a standard recipe for how to grow a safety culture within an organization. An, asset, an effective, mature safety culture is not achieved once and for all. It's a constant work in progress. Elements in safety culture are in fact perishable. There may be different requirements for developing a safety culture and detecting it and preventing its degradation, the degradation of one already in place. And as Marcus said, the Boeing case example is a wonderful illustration of this. An effective safety culture cannot be imposed simply by top level executive orders in an organization, nor can that implement implementation be offloaded onto a single safety officer or safety department. Development of safety culture has to evolve, adjust, correct and improve down through all levels and across all departments and units in an organization. Next slide, please. What are the components in trying to do a safety culture assessment? Well, one is survey questionnaires given to organizational employees across levels and departments and units uh, to get a description of current values, attitudes, and states of practice. These are generally liquor type scale, agree, disagree, one to five, one to seven scales. 
disagree or disagree with specific descriptive statements that are offered in the questionnaire. Secondly, individual or small group employee interviews across levels and departments and units are often part of safety culture assessment focus groups sometimes. Train observations of work processes across units, uh, observations of meetings, general meetings, work planning sessions, shift handoffs, et cetera, and uh, observation of supervisor employee communications and interactions. Lastly, a document review of procedures, minutes from meetings, corrective action reports, and the like. Next slide, please. So there are two culture, two approaches, it seems to me, to doing a safety culture assessment by a regulatory agency. One is I would call the accountability, responsibility, and compliance-based approach, which features an adversarial relationship, usually between the regulator and the utility, a focus on measured deficiencies in specific safety culture elements, and timetables for their remedy as part of prescriptive regulations, a formal legal proceeding which surrounds the acceptance of acceptance of assessment results with possible implications for fines and punishments. And lastly, a standardized new assessment process is sought with the same metrics applied for numerical comparison across utilities. Next slide, please. Um, the net another approach, however, quite different is a learning based approach. Here, a safety culture assessment method is a cooperative research and development process between a utility and its regulator. The assessment process is conducted in teams that include representatives from the regulator, as well as company employees and safety experts. Strategies and methods employed for assessment are themselves assessed as part of a learning and improvement process. And safety culture indicators and measurements are tested and revised for reliability and validity, including their long-term correlation with observable behaviors and safety outcomes. Next slide, please. Safety culture assessment, I have to say, will be a challenge for the CPUC because first, an important factor in assessing and promoting safety culture in an organization has been the effectiveness, persistence, and skill of its regulator in safety regulation. The effectiveness of the regulator's own safety culture and safety management system also affects its regulatory impact. Adding safety culture assessment is an exercise in regulating the intangible. As we've already said, it's a challenge and it will be a challenge for adversarial and prescriptive regulation. Next slide, please. Effective safety culture regulators in this country, the NIRC, and earlier, maybe not now, the FAA, and in Europe, it's at the Norwegian Petroleum Authority, Swedish Radiation Safety Authority, UK Health and Safety Executive, have several elements in common. Safety is their primary, if not exclusive mission. They do not have to regulate prices, employment law, or environmental and social justice with respect to their regulated organizations. The regulatory safety purview for each is most often confined to a limited set of technologies and their associated industries. Regulators for aviation, for nuclear power, for offshore drilling, or marine rail and road transport. These regulatory agencies have their own in-house expertise on safety management and safety culture. Many of them do their own safety culture assessments or issue guidelines for outside assessment teams. Next slide, please. Effective safety culture regulators have a significant inspection workforce. The NRC has two resident full-time inspectors at every nuclear power plant and nuclear fuel plant that it supervises, it regulates. These inspectors can add careful, trained observational information to safety culture assessments. I think the CPUC may want to consider these challenges in addition to the potential overlap of its own safety culture assessment to those of the Office of Energy Infrastructure Safety. What about thinking about a public independent expert safety culture and safety management system assessment unit that would be tasked by both the OIEIS and the CPUC to do assessments. Maybe perhaps it could be created in the California Council on Science and Technology. I know that these may not be very um, welcome comments, but I think it's worth thinking about these in relation to the objective, a major objective you're taking on. You are taking on the Mount Everest of safety regulatory tasks for a regulator. Thank you.
You're on mute. <laughs> Have I rendered everyone speechless? What happened here? No, that was just me not realizing I need to unmute after two years of working online still. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Dr. Shulman, for that presentation and for outlining the challenges associated with safety culture. I'm sure we'll have a lot of questions about your presentation in the panel discussion. Um, next, we're going to move on to um, Dom Cooper's presentation. Uh, just a quick note. So, uh, Dom's internet was out this morning, so I'm going to be controlling his his slides, but uh, he's he's on the phone. Um, so patience with this presentation and thank you for still uh, showing up, Dr. Cooper. Um, so, Dr. Cooper is a past professor of both safety and industrial and organizational psychology at, oops, at Indiana University um, in Bloomington. He's the, he's the CEO of Be Safe Management Solutions, CSMS. Um, in Greencastle, Indiana, and oper which operates in the Americas, Asia, Africa, Australasia, Europe, and the Middle East. Um, over the past 30 years, he has researched and written books, scientific papers, and professional articles on safety culture, safety leadership, and behavioral safety. Um, so I will pass it on to you, Dr. Cooper. I'm on your first introductory slide. Oh, thank you, ma'am. Um, I appreciate that. Uh, good morning, commissioners, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to present today and apologies for the um, collapse in the internet routers where I am. So um, today I want to talk to you about safety culture and safety climate and how they relate. So the safety culture and safety climate comparison, uh, which I think you can see, is that correct, Emma? So. And I'm assuming that you can see the comparison between safety culture yeah. and safety climate slide. So uh, the safety culture is a macro construct. It's aimed at organizations. Safety climate is a micro level construct that's aimed at individuals. The stability of culture is it's steady, it's durable, it takes a long time to change. And we're talking on average, somewhere between 10 and 20 years to change and shift a culture. The climate, safety climate, is transitory, it's temporary, and it's much more amenable to change. So it could change in an instant from a change in the supervisor, for example. There's the number of different original definitions for safety culture is in the region of 50 plus, and again, 30 plus for safety climate which tells us there's a lot of disagreement among researchers depending on discipline, so psychologists will have one view, sociologists, anthropologists, another view. Um, so, but they all boil down to, at the end of the day, to the way people think about safety or the way people behave in relation to safety. Safety culture is primarily concerned with group norms, i.e. the way we collectively do safety around here. Safety climate is much more concerned with people's perceptions of what we think of the way that safety is being operationalized right now. So safety culture is also measured by a variety of methods, which I believe has already been discussed. So we have audits, observations, focus groups, document analysis, interviews, and so on. Safety climate is measured primarily by a survey, some kind of psychometric survey with a Likert type scale, usually of one to five, sometimes one to seven, um, that target and aggregate task level perceptions. So it's very much based on the guys right down in the field on the shop floor. Safety climate has now ended up being used as a proxy measure of safety culture. It's a feature of safety culture, but it's not a good enough measure on its own um, to say that this is your safety culture. And some research has shown that to rely on those solely is a, a flawed uh, strategy. The purpose of safety culture is to ensure an entity's entire operations are conducted as safely as possible. The purpose of safety climate is to understand employee shared perceptions about the importance of safety in their organization. So 
if we can move to the next slide, please, uh, Emma, uh, this will show that there's various models of organisational safety culture. I did catch up and was lucky enough to hear Dr. Shulman, and I heard him describe uh, the Goulden on Shine approach, which is the first model in this slide, where the base of the triangle is invisible, unknown core basic assumptions. And based on those, we have these Bowles values in the middle layer or conscious attitudes towards an object. And then from those, that then creates or leads to the creation of various visible artifacts and behaviors. It's an anthropological approach. It seeks to understand culture and you can say it's interpretive, so it emerges, uh, but it's not empirically linked to actual safety incidents. And that, of course, could be just from the fact um, that it's qualitative rather than quantitative. However, it is used by Euro Control Air Traffic Management and the International Atomic Energy Agency. We then move across to the second column where we have James Reason's model which is a functionist approach or managerial approach where the managers seek to control and create or engineer a safety culture. And this is interlocking a number of interlocking smaller cultures that create the bigger safety culture. So James argues that we have a just culture. There's no blame that any accountability is just as in justice. Um, which then leads to a, a reporting culture. People are not fearful of reporting. It encourages reporting, leads to flexibility and approach, which leads to a learning culture, which leads to an informed culture, and all of those together create this safety culture. There is some evidence empirically linking the approach to safety incidents, and it's used, been used quite extensively in oil and gas uh, and uh, civil aviation, for example, in Switzerland, I believe. And then we have the interpretive functionist approach in the third column, which is Johnson and Scholes. And Johnson and Scholes came before um, Shine's model, I believe. And they both talk about underlying assumptions, or the paradigm, as it's called in um, the cultural web. And it's been around for a long time. I first came across it in the North Sea in 1999 with BP and Rob Buchan, uh, but they couldn't or didn't link it to incidents. But we've used it across the whole of North America and in the Middle East and other places. We've adapted it so it's qualitative and quantitative. And through doing that, we've been able to link this to incidents using multiple regression techniques, so predictive analytics, if you like. Um, has shown that we can link this to safety incidents in agriculture, metal refining, mining, and road transport. And then the last one on the far right is the reciprocal uh, determinism model, which is based on Albert Bandura's work of how people function on a day-to-day -day basis. So there's a relationship between the social norms, what we think about safety, hearts and minds, if you like, the psychological aspects, and then the descriptive norms, which is the behavior, the behaviors we uh, expect everyone to behave in certain situations, and then obviously the power of the situation. So the psychological aspects are invisible, and in a sense they go back to the base layer in the Goldemann model, um, but our research is showing, and others from Sweden and Spain and uh, France, the other, uh, the, the link between situation behavior is the strongest link and accounts for approximately 80% of safety performance. So if we move down the next slide, then here we can see a typical model of safety climate, which is primarily concerned with how an individual's perceptions, attitudes, and personality affect their safety knowledge and motivations, which in turn are thought to influence their safety compliance and safety participation behaviors which again, in turn, are thought to influence safety outcomes. Um, there's a lot of research um, showing that the relationships that we think are there are not necessarily what we think they are. Uh, a lot of the um, work on this field, I think is roughly 12% out of a thousand odd measures has actually even attempted to link these to um, actual safety performance rather than self-report safety performance. So, this is a field in a state of flux, 
but this is a, a, a lot of what people take safety culture as, um, albeit it's just a proxy. If we go to the next slide, here we're trying to, I've tried to work out the relationships between all of the models, including the safety climate. So on the vertical, we have the Golden Mons model with the underlying assumptions, the espoused values and the visible artifacts. On the horizontal, we have the reciprocal model with social norms, descriptive norms and injunctive norms overlaying, which creates us a grid of nine cells. In those nine cells, we've placed the topic areas of um, the cultural web and um, James Reason's uh, safety culture model. From there, we can see that safety climate resides in the espoused value grid under the social norms. And that's where Frank Goldemond put that in his 2010 PhD thesis. So when we look along that espoused on the uh, horizontal, we can see that James Reason's model by and large resides there. The so just culture, reporting culture, informative, learning and flexible is on the espoused values, albeit they're divided up into social norms, descriptive norms, the behaviours and the situation elements. And we can do the same with the cultural web. So we have the paradigm, which is the equivalent of Shine, Golden Mond's underlying assumptions. And as we go along to the injunction norms, we have organisational structures, power structures and control structures. And it's people's underlying assumptions about how those structures work that means it would go in that cell. We have on the espoused values the stories people tell and how they transmit the safety culture or stories about the culture and safety per se. And then on the horizontal for visible artifacts and the descriptive norms, we have the rituals and routines, which is the behaviours that people engage in. And we also have the symbols. So it's situational. Are people wearing um, PPE? Do they have the high visibility vests on? What's the signage? and so on and so forth, so the manuals for safety. So if we can go to the next slide, please, Emma, we can see the different methodologies that are used within each of those parts of the safety culture puzzle, as it were. So the focus groups, and in our experience, and I've been doing this work for 30 years now across the globe in numerous industries and numerous countries, and we're finding focus groups, we can measure most of those cells using that, um, depending on the instrument, of course. Um, the interviews uh, can be used for getting to the paradigm or the underlying assumptions, which I believe is one of the approaches that was taken with SEMPRA using and based on the IAEA's model. In terms of the safety climate, just culture, stories, and so on, that's psychometric surveys generally. In terms of descriptive norms, we've got behavioural observations. So there's a lot of processes, a whole discipline on behaviour-based safety, uh, where you target certain behaviours for both managers and the, uh, the workforce, um, which um, has shown some great results over the last 40 or 50 years. Very consistent. And then we have, uh, in terms of the injunctive norms and the structures and the situational aspects, we have system audits, documentation analysis, and site visits. Now, all of those can be used to produce numbers of numeric scales. They can all be put into percentages or whatever, and you can put them all on a common platform. Um, so using standardized means in a way, whichever way of the metrics are used. So if we can go down the next slide, please. Um, so safety culture assessment and safety climate assessment has to have targets. What are those targets and how common are they? And it's been very interesting with the work, some of the work that I've been doing with the reviews and so on, that we have the academic group that shows us that there's a commonality of topics in safety culture or safety climate and the likes of Sharon Clark from Manchester University, Rona Flynn from Robert Gordon's, and Kathy Burns from Aberdeen. Uh, they were the first ones pointing us in this direction. Then we have the results of public inquiries into catastrophes, such as Macondo or Deepwater Horizon, Texas City, Three Mile Island, that again are identifying similar or the same attributes. And then 
when we look at the loss of primary containment studies uh, conducted by regulators in Europe, so for example, the Health and Safety Executive, European Commission and the Dutch Labour Inspectorate, we're finding the same things again. So there's, there's general consensus and agreement that these seven topics are very significant safety issues that are constantly appearing in catastrophes and uh, safety incidents as well as personal injury incidents. So they are clearly would be at the target of activity. And if we go to the next slide, where the, we have a revised safety culture model, the reciprocal model has been revised to reflect uh, the changes in the research landscape, if you like, from 2000 when this was first published through to 2016. And here we can see we have the psychological factors. So we have values. A lot of people, when they talk about safety culture, talk about values, attitudes, beliefs, and norms, and perceptions, and so on. And they all sit there. But one of the difficulties, when uh, London Aero in Sweden, for example, showed if you focus on attitude to, to reduce incidents and change behavior and so on, it doesn't work terribly well. There's very weak relationships. But if you focus on uh, behavior situation and then the attitudes follow, then they're quite strong relationships. And they showed that for um, all sorts of different uh, incidents, not just industrial safety incidents. So we have value. So a value has six parts to it. So when we talk about a value, which part, there's six criteria there that have to be focused on and addressed. When we talk about attitudes, then we, there's four components. We have a cognitive component, what people think. We have an effective component, how people feel about their object or something. We have an evaluative component, which says, well, is this object good or bad? And then we have a cognitive component that says, what are we going to do about these things? So if you think there's multitudes of attitudes for multitudes of objects in safety, then someone somehow has got to target all of those different components for all of those things just to try and change attitude. And it perhaps explains why attitude change to improve safety is, is much weaker than people realize. We then got the norms, so we've got subjective norms. What do we think other people expect of us? And we've got descriptive norms, our behaviours. And some of the research in there says we take our cues from our co-workers, much stronger um, cues from our co-workers than from our leaders and managers. So there's a lot of things going on in the psychological space that have you not yet been bottomed out. And the research is showing um, that it's not as, as strong and perhaps is the wrong area to focus on in terms of improving actual safety performance. So when we look then at the situation where we've got safety culture characteristics and the significant safety issues, we have a one-to-one -one correspondence with those things. And from there, we can say, well, okay, well, we've got management and supervision. And I know from research I did in the Middle East with over 3 million observations that um, safety leadership is really important and can help improve safety performance by up to 82%. So you have management supervision and the significant safety issue is management supervision. So for example, 80% of all the process safety disasters in the world are caused by managerial non-compliance with the rules and procedures. It's not the guys per se, they have some element in it, but it's primarily managers. So we can, if we target our safety culture objects and what we're going to measure based on the research, we should have much stronger links to this safety culture product, which is in 2000 when I first developed this model, it was defined as that observable degree of effort by which everyone in an organization directs their attentions and actions towards improving safety on a daily basis. So it gives you something tangible, and I believe it was used in healthcare since 2004, that product is a way forward. And all of those things together will then hit uh, impact on the measurable outcomes. So the leading indicators and the lagging indicators surrounding process safety and personal injury. So this was a revised model that reflects all the findings in research up to 2016. So if we can move to the next slide, please. Um, uh, sorry for interrupting, yeah, Dr. I, uh, we will have a three minutes left for now. Yeah, that's fine. 
Um, it's just very quickly here. This is where I looked at the IAA safety culture assessment that was done in Sempra recently. And we have a, um, a safety culture maturity model. And I looked at the IAEA. And so in terms of social norms or espoused value, safety is a clearly recognized value. So our safety culture maturity model um, in, uh, measures uh, a just culture and profit before safety or safe production is the number one priority, the balance between those two. In terms of descriptive norms, you have safety is integrated in all activities, leadership uh, for safety is clear and accountability. And again, we're finding here we've got safety leadership and managerial non-compliance as functional domains in the safety culture maturity model. And then when we look at the injunctive norms, we have strategy, we have risk assessment, we have lessons learned, safety communication, safety competence, and corrective and preventive actions. And what was nice listening to the feedback from the SEMPRA output of the assessment was that these are all exactly the same topics that they um, concluded were the issues. So that was a bit of a delay to find out that we're all in agreement. Um, if you go to the next slide, please. Uh, we have here now a safety culture assessment process. So the top one is a typical approach. This is one that we did in 2010 across all the terminals that cook down the North Sea and round in the Mediterranean. And for each assessment, we have six weeks. Um, so we have worked, um, worked with the entity to identify the issues, do workplace audit inspections, conduct online surveys, in on-site focus groups, behavioral observations and interviews, bring all of those things together and then write our draft report and present. Or we've got a different way of doing it where we were able to link these findings on the uh, cultural web to a whole basket of indicators and were able to test the different safety culture models was we did one day focus group exercises with 50 people per facility, divide them into groups of five, give them the appropriate questions or issues that you want to, them to respond to. You collate the results which you can uh, create into a safety culture maturity score. Those scores can be correlated with incident data to validate the responses that you've got. And the qualitative data that's also collected at the same time is used to uh, identify sources of evidence to validate the responses that you've got. And we want to use, where possible, existing um, results. So we've got, if an entity has safety climate survey results, and I think DECRA is using a safety climate survey, they can be used. Safety management system audit results, which I suspect the IOUs are already doing, and they've got the scores for those. And I suspect they're also doing behavioral safety. So there's all this existing evidence that's already there that can be used to validate the safety culture assessment responses. So they're just different ways of doing it, but this one would be quicker and the time frame would be reduced. And when you think of the number of IOUs and the number of facilities and the amount of data that would be coming into the CPUC and the authorities, then you need to be able to somehow help facilitate this all land in a coherent fashion. So that would be the end of my presentation. And thank you so much for the opportunity um, to present this to you. And I hope you found it useful. Thank you so much, Dr. Cooper. Um, seeing that we're a little bit ahead of schedule, uh, why don't we take a five minute break and return at 1020 and we can get back on schedule. Um, so I will stop sharing my screen and I will share. Um, Oh, uh, we can join back at 1020. Thanks, everyone.
Great. So it's 1020 now, so we can continue with our presentations. Up next, we have Dr. Claudine Bradley, uh, who is a technical leader, human and organizational factors for the Canada Energy Regulator, Canada's federal agency responsible for regulating international and interprovincial aspects of the oil, gas, and electric utility industries. Claudine provides leadership and counsel on management systems, safety culture, and other safety systems system safety matters related to activities under the jurisdiction of the Canada Energy Regulator. Prior to joining the CER, Claudine spent 17 years in the aviation industry where she led various airline safety training and operations teams. And I will pass it on to you, Claudine, I can control your slides. Thanks, Emma. And uh, thank you to the CPUC for the invitation to share some thoughts on our uh, safety culture journey um, as a regulator and moving into a bit of an unknown space. We've actually been engaged in this work for just coming up to about nine years. So I'm hoping that some of the insights I share today may, may uh, resonate with the CPUC and happy to take questions, of course. Um, in terms of what I'd like to do, uh, first I'll give you a very brief introduction to my agency just for context. Um, but then I'd like to focus on the general uh, philosophy and approach we've taken with regards to our safety culture work. Um, I'll share some specific activities that we've been engaged in over the past uh, nine years, describe where we are today, um, because it has been an iterative process where we've continued to learn and make adjustments. And then at the very end of the presentation, I'll give you a very brief look at our results to date based on data that we collect on an annual basis from our regulated entities. Um, so if you wanna to go to the next slide, Emma. So uh, again, I'll be very brief here. Um, we were formerly known as the National Energy Board. Um, in 2019, we became the CER. We are the federal agency that's responsible for safety and environmental oversight for financial regulation, including tolls and tariffs. Um, we're responsible for socioeconomic, socioeconomic interests um, as well as uh, project approvals. So we have an adjudicative uh, arm and hearings uh, that are conducted in order to determine whether or not projects are in the public interest. If you go to the next slide, Emma. Um, we, in fact, regulate interprovincial and international oil and gas pipelines, um, international power lines. We do have jurisdiction uh, for offshore exploration and production in Canada's north in the Arctic although we don't have any uh, current activities there. And we were recently granted oversight for future offshore renewables. And uh, we currently have regulations that are being drafted for that purpose, but we'll have oversight responsibilities. So that gives you a pretty good sense of the work that we do. Uh, if you go to the next slide for me, Emma. So um, obviously our, one of our core missions or our core mission is the prevention of harm to people and the environment. And as a regulator in this space, unsurprisingly, you know, we rely on a lot of transactional activities, compliance-based verification activities, enforcement where necessary. Um, in 2014, 2015, we promulgated a very extensive suite of management system requirements. Um, and we also conduct uh, audits of those uh, requirements. But around 2016 or 2017, we added this additional pillar of the safety culture. And you see at the bottom of the arrow, uh, the reference to systemic influence. It was at that time, we were probably about, I don't know, five years into our safety culture journey in terms of trying to understand it and understand the role that we could play as the regulator, uh, that this was added to our kind of fundamental framework. So we continue to rely on those traditional um, compliance verification and enforcement activities but we have invested considerable um, effort in trying to influence the safety culture um, of our regulated entities to bring attention to the very important topic and improve general understanding of why it's so important to keep a keen uh, eye on safety culture signals. Um, and so if we go to the next slide, I think it'll give you a, a better sense of our general philosophy and uh, I think Paul gave a very good introduction to two general approaches that can be taken. We certainly lean towards uh, the approach number two that he described. Um, but in essence, we made the decision early on that we would not explicitly codify safety culture in regulation. 
As I mentioned, we do have management system requirements, and I could probably make a very strong argument that many, if not all of those elements have a significant correlation to what we would think of as a healthy safety culture, um, if they are well-designed, implemented, and effective. Um, but we did you know, have some conversations early on with our board at the time um, and made the case that we felt it would be counterproductive and counterintuitive uh, to try to regulate a healthy safety culture. Instead, what we've done is really focus on system influence. So industry-wide uh, themes and trends, education and outreach, um, as well as moving towards the inclusion of a holistic company performance lens. And I'll speak to that in a little bit. Um, we have, over the past nine years, really invested a lot of time and energy into outreach, education, collaborating with our industry, um, a lot of feedback loops, which I'll describe a little bit later because we recognized early on this was a very new area for a regulator to, to move. Um, it is a learning journey uh, for our regulated entities, but also for ourselves. And so we wanted to ensure that we could continually hear um, from them um, and also share our thoughts with them and just continue to learn together. I think probably the, the, the biggest point in terms of our philosophy is this final point you see on the, on the deck. We really wanted to focus on relationship building and developing a degree of trust so that we could have conversations around culture. Um, as you might imagine, when we first moved into this space, we were met with a significant amount of resistance um, from companies saying, you know, what could the regulator possibly know about their organizational culture? And really, this should be kind of out of bounds. Um, and I think to a great extent that was because there was a fear that we were going to add additional regulations and regulatory expectations um, that would, you know, make things more challenging for them as they were embarking uh, through the development and implementation of a very extensive suite of management system requirements. And I'll be very honest, it took several years, I think, for them to come to the conclusion that we were being honest brokers when we said this was a learning journey uh, for both of us uh, in terms of our, the groups um, and that we really wanted to learn collectively. We also, uh, around 2016, 2017, you know, very clearly acknowledged that we were aware of the fact that our culture as a regulator could have significant impact um, on their efforts in this space, but potentially uh, some impact in terms of safety and environmental protection outcomes. And so we could see in ourselves, if we could hold the mirror up to ourselves, uh, we could see just how difficult this work is. And we wanted to make it clear that we were prepared to look at ourselves in this way, just as we were um, trying to encourage uh, our regulated entities to do the same. Um, I think Paul said this is kind of like the Everest <laughs> of safety regulation, and I would absolutely agree with that. Um, and um, we have certainly tried along the way to build this degree of trust so that we can come together, um, listen to one another, learn from one another, and leverage each other's experiences um, for the better of the industry as a whole. If you go to the next slide, Emma. So I do want to say that very early on, we did um, put out some expectations. So we did as I said, we didn't want to codify this in regulation, but we did want to be clear about what our expectations were. So uh, they were threefold. The first was that we wanted our regulated entities to be aware of and understand that the role that culture plays in preventing organizational accidents, a, a term coined by James Reason, again, talking about these low probability, high consequence, catastrophic events. Um, we wanted uh, their leaders to establish and foster a healthy safety culture through their actions and decisions, not just through their espoused, you know, values and the, the things that they talked about. Um, and we wanted the companies to build and sustain a positive safety culture while they continue to scrutinize their organizations for potential cultural threats. Um, and so with those expectations uh, documented, we set out to listen to our companies um, and, and hear how we could help support this work and, uh, and their achievement of these expectations. If you go to the next slide, Emma. Okay, so 
I'd like to just talk about the, the period from 2014 through 2019. These are kind of the historical efforts and the building blocks uh, that we developed along the way, um, again, in concert and in response to what we were hearing from industry. If you go to the next slide. So the very first thing that we actually did um, back in 2013, 2014 was establish a group called the North American Regulators Working Group on Safety Culture. Um, and uh, there are two US uh, members, so the Bureau of Safety and Environmental Enforcement, the offshore regulator uh, in the US, as well as FIMSA, the Pipeline and Hazardous Materials Safety Administration. They actually were founding members of this group along with uh, us, um, and they continue to sit on this group. And uh, it was important early on, as I said, we knew we were kind of on the leading edge of this in the space of oil and gas. Um, and we wanted to bring together like-minded parties who knew that there was a place for us here as regulators, but wasn't, we weren't quite sure what that place was. Um, so we actually established this group. Um, we continue to meet uh, today. So, uh, you know, eight years, eight, nine years later, we meet every three weeks. And basically it's a community of practice for regulators who wanna do the right things in this space and learn from one another's experiences. The next thing that we did was we released a statement on safety culture. And I'm gonna mention this probably throughout this, this document became really a foundational piece uh, to our work um, over this past, what's coming up to almost a decade. Um, this document is where we articulated our expectations that I just referenced. Um, we defined safety culture, which we realized was really important um, because I think Mark alluded to this, the more rooms we went into, the more people we spoke to about safety culture, the clearer it became that there were vastly different interpretations of what safety culture meant and how it might be applied. So we wanted to be very clear that we were talking about these low probability, high consequence events, that we were not looking at lost time, injury rates or occupational health and safety rates, although one might be able to argue that if you do you know, some good work in the safety culture realm relative to these organizational accidents, you can have some positive impacts elsewhere, but that was not the focus of our, our efforts here. It was about uh, the prevention of catastrophic events with widespread uh, consequences to, to people and the environment. We also drilled down much more clearly, I think at the time, um, to articulate what we thought safety culture looked like when it was being expressed within a company. Um, and, you know, we've heard that safety culture is a construct. It's very difficult for a lot of people to get their heads around, you know, what it actually means. Um, and so we consulted the academic literature at the time and tried to build as descriptive a framework as possible for what it meant for us as the CER um, in collaboration with our two offshore petroleum boards um, at the federal level here in Canada. It was actually a joint product. So we released that um, and I, I can say that we got initially some resistance again because companies weren't quite sure what we were gonna do with this. Um, but over time, we have actually seen a significant uptake in use of that framework that was developed. Um, we were always very clear at, at the outset that this was the framework we would apply and utilize and so that everyone had a common understanding when we used terms and when we met with companies um, and industry as a whole. Um, but that we certainly encourage companies to take it, uh, change it, amend it, make it resonate within their organizations or find something else that worked better for them. Um, there really was flexibility throughout, but we wanted to be clear that when we communicated around safety culture, this is what we meant. Shortly thereafter, um, we actually convened uh, a group, our North American Regulators Working Group got together and created a research project uh, where we conducted qualitative interviews with our um, inspectors and management system auditors and incident investigators um, in order to try to, again, parse out the things that as regulators during just the normal course of our activities as a regulator, where there were signals of safety culture. And that led to the development of a suite of safety culture indicators or signals um, that we created and that we shared with our regulated entities. Again, everything that we do gets made public um, and is considered a tool for their use if they find it useful for their purposes. 
Um, and then shortly after that project, we actually did another project where we sent those indicators out to a group of subject matter experts, um, practitioners and academics around the world, uh, just to test the validity of the indicators. And we got very, very favorable results. Um, so once again, a, a new product, something else for our uh, regulated entities to, to utilize and for us as regulators to contemplate for future use. We did at the CER actually conduct a pilot project based on a select group of those indicators that we tried to um, gather evidence of during, again, traditional inspections. So nothing unusual, the inspectors just trained to go out and look for these specific signals and then come back with evidence that would then be vetted by our HOF experts. Um, and interestingly enough, you know, we had identified early on that inspections would be one of the hardest places to detect these signals. Um, what we found was that it would take far too long actually for us, just based on the way that we're structured, the way that we conduct our um, inspections, the way we assign resources, it would take too long for us to gather enough signals to actually make any kind of, you know, interpretive evaluation um, that would have any, you know, real face validity. So. Um, we are continuing other efforts, which I'll speak to briefly in a few slides, uh, to try to use these indicators really to collect signals um, in the context of the work that we do so that we can then share those with individual companies, but also the industry at large if there are themes and trends that are developing. We also, during this you know, first five-year uh, time frame, conducted a, a ton of outreach, as you might expect, so speaking at lots of conferences and uh, communities of practice. And we started um, facilitated workshops with our Group One companies in 2019. So our Group One companies, uh, in terms of pipeline operations, are the very large, you know, multinationals. Um, and we met with them again, trying to create a, a safe space, really, um, where they could share with us as the regulator, uh, yes, but also with their peers what they were doing with regards to safety culture and what they were learning, the successes and the failures. Um, it provided us an opportunity to talk about the things we were trying, including that pilot project I just mentioned, which you know, to some extent was a failure, <laughs> um, but we learned from it and it continued to inform the path ahead. And really uh, what we found was that in these workshops, there was a great deal, because the trust had been built up and because there was really a keen understanding that this was not going to lead to enforcement. This was not a compliance-based activity. This was purely uh, for the purposes of promoting learning and continual improvement. We heard some really incredible candid stories about the challenges that some of our companies were facing. Um, we also saw some great peer-to-peer -peer relationships being built. And uh, some companies that were struggling in some areas were able, after the fact, to reach out to their peers um, to to have further conversations and to learn from them, which was um, an additional um, benefit of these events. And then we continue to have formal and informal collaboration. So we are constantly reaching out to other um, industry associations, um, other high hazard uh, industries and regulators. We continue conversations with the US NRC, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission, um, the uh, aviation sector, uh, rail, so there's continual conversations, particularly with regulators um, who are interested in investing in this kind of work. And uh, we've also been involved in a couple of studies uh, at the National Academy of Sciences. So if you go to the next slide, Emma. Sorry for interruption, Dr. Bradley. Uh, there are three minutes left for your presentation. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, so I'm not going to speak to this because I think Mark did a, a very nice job of introducing it. This was uh, the framework that we introduced as part of that statement on safety culture. And as I said, we've seen really a broad adoption um, and, and some customization of the framework uh, for use by many of our companies. If you go to the next slide. Um, and then I'll get you to go to the next slide. I'll just touch on our three year strategy. Um, so you'll see, I think, some of the same themes, and, but this uh, 2020 was the first time we actually sat down and were a bit more strategic about what the three years would look like for us. So system influence, so again, sharing learning, collaboration, developing lots of tools, 
Um, and then the company performance piece was really about trying to understand in our current data sets from incidents, um, inspections and audits, could we actually extract safety culture signals um, or other signals from that set? And then could we then be able to have conversations, again, not compliance or enforcement focused, but learning conversations about the things we were seeing because we have a unique perspective as regulators. Um, if you go to the next slide. Um, the statement on safety culture, a couple of things that have just happened in this during this three-year strategy, we did update the statement. It had been a number of years um, coming and obviously we wanted to reflect where we were in the journey now. And the quotes that you'll see in the next couple of slides, these are just some feedback uh, comments that have come to us from accountable officers about the impact we may be having. Uh, if you go to the next slide, we learn, uh, launched a learning portal uh, this year. It's called the Safety Culture Learning Portal. Again, uh, taking the feedback from our various folks um, from our workshops, which we have now annually with both our group ones, big companies, as well as the group twos. Um, we hear what they are looking for in terms of potential tools. And so we've launched this central um, location where they can go and, and gather information. So there's safety culture moments related to safety culture threats and defenses. We just launched this week, we just published a safety culture assessment guide. It's really kind of foundational 101, getting the basics. Um, and so that's available for our folks. And if you go to the next slide, um, I think I've talked about the workshops already. Um, as I mentioned, we've done some work with the National Academy of Sciences. And one of the uh, most significant tasks that we just completed uh, this year, and it's about to be published, is a Canadian Standards Association express document on human and organizational factors, which includes a section on safety culture, governance, leadership, and management system functioning and effectiveness, all intended, again, to help support um, industry and, and their evolving maturity in this space. If you go to the next slide for me, so, and one more slide, please, Emma. I said that I would uh, close with just a couple of um, points around data we collect. So annually we have something called a DRF, Departmental Results Framework, where we evaluate our performance and it gets reported back to the Parliament of Canada. And one of our um, measures is around how much influence we're having on the system. Are, are we making an impact in this space? Um, so I just wanted to share 2021, um, we um, heard from our companies and we have about, just because of the legal breakdowns of companies, about 60 entities, 37 of them noted that they were actually involved in safety culture program development and impl implementation. Um, we had a large number who are conducting safety culture related training. 19 uh, noted that they had conducted safety culture assessments in the past year. Um, and 12 uh, noted that they had brought in safety culture experts to help consult. And if you go to the next slide, which I think is essentially the final. Um, what we saw, um, so we started collecting in 2018, we've seen an upward train, trend rather in terms of companies who are investing resources uh, to safety culture. And 65% of those um, who are doing it noted that the CER had contribu contributed to, excuse me, or influenced their organization's safety culture advancement efforts. Um, and actually today is the closing of the 2022 uh, period. So it'll be interesting to see what, uh, what we see in the data um, coming up. So I'll just, uh, one more slide, Emma, and I won't speak to this at any length. I just wanted to let you know that I have shared links of interest. So the Safety Culture homepage will essentially show you all of the materials that we have published in this space. Um, the Statement on Safety Culture is there. The Indicators Research Project is there. And then there's a unique link to the learning portal um, that I mentioned where you would see our safety culture kind of 101 guidance document that was published on Monday. So I'll leave it there uh, again, open to uh, questions and discussion, but very much appreciate the opportunity to share uh, this journey that we have been on and that uh, continues to evolve. So thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Bradley. I expect that we'll continue to look at your expertise as we continue this work um, in California. Um, so our next and final speaker is gonna continue on the trend of giving us some practical examples of how um, regulators have 
approach safety culture. And it, this, this ne next speaker will be Chris Hart. So Chris Hart is the former chairman of the National Transportation Safety Board or the NTSB. Um, after Chris retired from the NTSB, the, Nash, the Federal Airline Administ Administration selected him to lead the Joint Authorities Technical Review. This group was created after the two tragic Boeing 737 MAX tra crashes to bring together aircraft certification experts from the FAA and nine other aviation regulatory authorities around the world, plus NASA, to examine their air aircraft certification process and make recommendations to make it more robust. Um, so I will pass it on to you, Chris. Thank you for joining us today. Well, thank you, Emin. I want to thank the commission for for <clears throat> inviting me to speak because it's a pleasure to speak. I've, I've been before you before. Unfortunately, the last time was in relation to the uh, San Bruno pipeline explosion, but but uh, it's an honor to be invited once. It's even more of an honor <clears throat> to be invited back again. So thank you very much. Next slide, please, Emma. So, so what I'm going to talk about is something that Dr. Bradley <clears throat> touched on quite a bit, and that is collaboration between the regulator <clears throat> and the remainder of the industry. Excuse me, I'm, excuse me, my my throat is is bothering me. But in in aviation, the challenge was that that they had a declining, rapidly declining fatal rate, fatal accident rate that that went that stopped stopped that decline in the 90s. And the reason for the decline was basically new technologies like automation and simulators and jet engines. So. So those technologies are reaching the, the asymptotically reaching the, the limit of improvement. And, and that's why the uh, rate stopped declining in the early 90s and the industry was very concerned because the FAA was predicting that the volume of flying would double in the next 15 to 20 years. So simple arithmetic tells you double volume times flat stub rate means that Joe Public is gonna be seeing twice as many fatal accidents on, on the news. And that's, that's what concerned them. And so they created the Commercial Aviation Safety Team, which is a voluntary industry-wide collaborative program that has uh, that has not been fully replicated. The closest to it is is what the nuclear industry is doing with INPO, but <clears throat> nobody has has replicated this. And the and the collaboration includes basically everybody who's got a dog in the fight, and significantly, it also includes the regulator. And that was a big fight bringing the regulator in. So so that's what I'll talk about is an industry wide safety culture. So I'll bring I'll bring this to a, a different perspective than the than most of the other presentations this morning, which have talked about safety culture at a company level. I'm talking about it at and industry level. So next slide, please. So the idea is when you have a system of connected coupled subsystems and the couplings aren't necessarily linear, things get pretty complicated when you try to make changes. So if you make a change to one subsystem to try to improve it, you have a high likelihood of having unintended consequences in some of the other subsystems. And that's that's one of the big challenges because what we're seeing in, in this complicated system is that safety issues are are most likely not because of just one piece of the system, but it's because of the interaction between the parts of the system. And that's what makes things very difficult to predict and difficult to fix. Next slide, please. So the solution is understanding, I, I call it system thing, understanding how a change in one subsystem will, will affect the other subsystems within that system. And that, that's a big challenge. And, and the way, next slide, please, the way the aviation industry went after this was through collaboration. So they bring every all the parts together, the airports, the operators, the manufacturers, the regulator, the pilots, the controllers, the maintenance crews, everybody, everybody together to collaboratively figure out how to make this system work better. So so that their four their four chores were first to identify what the issues are, then they found how necessary it was to prioritize those issues because they quickly realized that they're going to have more issues identified and they're going to have resources to fix. So they have to put some in the front burner some on the back burner and then develop solutions for the front burner ones and then evaluate whether those solutions are working as, as hoped for and not creating any unintended consequences. Next slide, please. Good point. So the objectives were, were twofold. Number one, make the system less likely to cause error and hit the next slide, please. And more likely to be toler to, to tolerate the error without catastrophic constant consequence. So that was the objectives of, of of cast. Next slide, please. So this is a new paradigm. There's going to be several repeated clicks on this, so you can just go ahead and do several of them until until you get to until you fill up both sides. So what we we found was that <clears throat> if the the system was primarily based on punishment, which assumed that people were doing the wrong thing. That's that's good. You can stop right there, please. People were doing the wrong thing, so the usual response to that was punishment. But when they realized, guess what? Most of these people 
with, with very few exceptions, are here to do to trying to do the right thing. So if they're trying to do the right thing and they still make mistakes, then maybe we ought to look at the system in which they are operating and not only look at the individuals who are always accountable for what they do, but also look at the system in which they're working to see what, why that system allowed that mistake or why it failed to accommodate that mistake and then see what we can do to improve the system. So it was basically a change in focus, pretty much as Dr. Bradley said, to try to convince the industry this is not a punishment exercise, this is an improvement exercise and and that's that's what really got this moving was getting people to realize you know what they, they are here to make my life better they're not here to punish me they're here to make my life better so i can do my job better next slide please so they brought together the the, the whole cast of characters airlines manufacturers they, air, air traffic organization labor and and work together to try to improve the system and the, and next slide will tell you the outcome the outcome was absolutely amazing because this flat stuck rate that a lot of safety experts at the time said was about as good as it would ever get. They took that flat stuck rate and decreased it another 83% in less than 10 years, largely because they had they applied system think and they fueled it with proactive safety information about errors and near misses because the errors and near misses are what really showed where the system wasn't working as desired. It wasn't showing bad people. It was showing problems with the system. So if you go after the problems with the system, then you can really make it make life better for everyone. So that was the amazing outcome of CAS, 83% decrease in this un, in this stuck, un, unimprovable flat accident rate in less than 10 years. Next slide, please. So the success was not only an 83% safety improvement, they also found that guess what? A, a big challenge in, as I mentioned at the at the outset, a big challenge in complex system is when you is when you change something in one subsystem, you're gonna have unintended consequences in another subsystem or subsystems. And, th and that's what they found that they reduced that significantly. But, but most significantly, what they did while they were improving safety was they also improved productivity. And that was crucial. That wasn't an initial objective, but it was a crucial outcome because when you improve productivity, what you do is you make the safety improvement sustainable because as much as we safety experts hate to say it, if a safety improvement is not going to improve the bottom line, it's probably not sustainable. So this has been so sustainable, it started more than 20 years ago and it's still going strong because it improved productivity. Another uh, benefit of it was they, the, the, one of the reasons that they went this direction and went to, the voluntary, went to the voluntary collaborative approach is because the administrator of the FAA, when this was starting in the 90s, was saying, we are stuck on a, on a rate plateau, but the way to get off this plateau is not to give me, the regulator, more power, a bigger stick, not to increase enforcement, but for all of us to work together to try to figure out how to make this complex system work better. And, and that's exactly what happened because they did that 83% improvement without CAST generating a single new regulation. So the point was they were all about safety and compliance was way back in their rearview mirror. They, didn't, they weren't concerned about con compliance because they were way beyond that and their primary focus was safety. Next slide, please. So the moral of the story is really quite simple. If you're involved in the problem, you ought to be involved in the solution. And that's what they did. And it was, as I say, completely voluntary and it's going strong to this day. And the co-leaders of it are a co-leader from industry and a co-leader from the regulator. So, so they're collaborating intense, intensely on a daily basis to, to, to generate improvements. Next slide, please. So then you might ask, well, gee, if this works so well, how come collaboration doesn't happen more? Well, because there are lots of challenges of collaboration. So, First one is human nature. Human nature is I'm doing fine. The rest of you turkeys out there aren't doing what you need to do. So why don't you get your act together, then come to me. I mean, that's very much like, what do you mean? Why do I, why should I go to the marriage counselor? You're the one who needs the marriage counseling, not me. So, so human nature is I'm doing great and you're not. So, so that's, that's a challenge to get past. But more than that, the participants often have differing and sometimes even competing interests, labor and management. They, there may be co-defendants co in court when there's a crash, the, Airline is a defendant, the manufacturer is a defendant. So they're beating up on each other, showing not my fault, not, not my fault. The regulator isn't welcome because people don't want to bear their dirty laundry in front of the regulator. And the regulator, meanwhile, doesn't want to be there because the regulator is saying, wait a minute, this smacks up a democracy. The law says I'm the regulator. I'm supposed to be in charge of this thing as opposed to a democracy where we all vote. What do you guys want to do? And we'll vote on it. We'll do that. <clears throat> but it didn't turn out to be that at all. What it was, was a, was a, a rich source of information so that now for the first time, everybody understood everybody else's perspective. So the usual way it works is the regulator says, I'm gonna put out a notice of proposed rulemaking because I see a problem that you guys have and here's what you need to do to fix it. 
then industry says, hey, regulator, I don't like your identification of the problem and your, and your solution is even worse and your solution is not going to help improve safety. And meanwhile, while it's not improving safety, it's going to hurt my productivity. So I'm going to fight it every way I can. I'm going to fight it in court. I'm going to fight it with the legislators. I'm going to fight it every way I can. So that makes a, an adversarial process. My experience from a statistically valid sample of one is that a collaborative relationship is much more is much more productive collaborative between the regulator and the regulated and an, 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 an adversarial relationship between the regulator and the regulated is a huge lose lose. So this was an amazing example of how when they work together, then they can then they can get things done. And what what it does is now instead of when the when the regulator puts out a notice of proposed rulemaking, the regulator hears from A and they hear from e, hear from B and they hear from C. But what never gets in the conversation is what does A think of what B and C think. So now when they're collaborating. Everybody hears everybody's perspectives in a way it never, that never happened before, and now they much they understand that wow we're here to improve the whole system, which we will all benefit from because we are part of the system. So so it requires everybody to be willing to come to the table in their enlightened self interest, take off their me first hat, and think of improving the system so that everybody wins. Next slide, please. Well, actually, just hit the button once. This is the linchpin again. You heard that from several of the presenters this morning. The, linch, the linchpin of this whole process is trust because everybody has to trust each other that yes, we are here to fix the system and not just to benefit ourselves. Next slide, please. So this was a huge paradigm shift because like I say, the old way to do it is the industry regulator says, here's what I see you guys have a problem. Here's what I see you think I see, I see needs to be done to fix it and industry disagrees so they fight it. In the new one, hit the, hit the button once more, please. In the new one, now they're doing it collaboratively so now the industry is involved in identifying the problem. And that means by the time a, a solution comes out of that pipeline, the industry has buy-in because everybody's considerations were taken into account in developing the solution. So now they have prompt and willing implementation versus fighting over rules forever. They also have interventions that are evaluated for, for how well they work. And if they don't quite work the way they're supposed to, they're tweaked voluntarily as needed because now everybody has an ownership interest in it. Everybody has buy-in and they want to make it work so they tweak it as needed versus with a regulation. You can't tweak a regulation. You have to put in a new regulatory proposal. So, that, so they tweak it as needed. So now the solutions are more effective, more efficient, and they don't have unintended consequences. What an amazing success story in a complex system. So, so the safety level was so far above the floor of regulatory compliance that they didn't need any new regulations. Next slide, please. Well, the fuel for the collaboration, of course, is next hit the button once more is information because the information about errors and near misses is what shows what needs to be fixed in the system to make these good, competent, proud professionals try to do the job better. So that's 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 where the key is to have that information. And so that's why we have some legislation that helps protect that information so that people won't be afraid to put it into this process. Next slide, please. So here's the key is you take lots of data, mostly from the front line. I mean, lots and lots of data, because now with flight data recorders, you can get thousands of parameters eight times a second. So you got lots of data. And the idea is to put that through the tools and processes of the analytical process to do the four steps that I mentioned, identify, prioritize, solve, and evaluate. So that's that's what how they get from data with all this collaborative process to an improved outcome. Next slide, please. So the question is, does this apply to other industries? And I would give a big strong yes on that, even though <clears throat> there's not a lot of evidence to indicate that it does. I'm trying hard to put it to, in healthcare because I think there's huge opportunity now to take aviation safety successes and improve healthcare by looking at looking beyond just errors and looking at threats. I don't see the healthcare world looking at, at anything but errors. They're, they're looking primarily at errors. They need to be focusing more on threats. But I think every mode that we've talked about today could be could use this collaborative approach and not only does it work to improve what I call process safety, which is the airplane crashing or the plant blowing up. It also works to improve workplace safety, which we which we talked about this morning as well. It's not quite it's not exactly the same process, but I think the same collaborative approach can improve workplace safety. And, and much better than any other approach that's being tried. <clears throat> and here's one of the amazing things is that even aviation isn't using it for workplace safety, even though it works so well for their process safety for stopping airplanes from crashing, but I am, I see no reason <clears throat> why it can't work as well in all industries in workplace safety. Next slide, please. I think we're up to the concluding slide. <clears throat> so this was a, a situation where 
the it was kind of chicken and egg question. Did the did the collaboration start the health healthy safety culture, or was the healthy safety culture a result of the collaboration? So so which one started which is not entirely clear, but but the mere fact that it exists shows that there's an industry wide desire to improve safety, and that's very simple in, in aviation. Nobody, nobody, nobody ever wants an airplane to crash. So that's that's one of the reasons why this can go so strong, and and people don't think of aviation as as gee, I'm I, I, that crash that crash happened overseas. I don't care about that because I'm flying to Pittsburgh. Well, even when a German airplane crashes in the French Alps, someone flying to Pittsburgh is going to say, "Wow, that was an airplane crash," and I'm concerned about it. So so today's media makes people concerned about crashes everywhere in the world, and that's what lights a fire under this industry to do what what an amazing job they've done, and they they carried. In 10 years or so in the US, they carried some billion passengers with only one fatality. What an amazing safety record that is. So, so having said that, getting, getting that started, as I said, there are challenges to getting people to collaborate. So getting that healthy safety culture started can be very challenging, but the air, airline industry has shown that collaboration can, can be a way to implement a healthy safety culture. And by the way, in this entire process, they never mentioned safety culture. They never mentioned safety management system. In fact, they, this, started long before those were popular notions, but they yet generated a system that has all the elements of a good safety culture and all the elements of a strong, healthy safety management system. So collaboration can really help improvement program, create safety improvement programs and also improve productivity so that they are sustainable. What a huge, amazing success story this has been. And, and if I can do anything to help anybody try to bring that to their, to their domain, I'd be happy to do that because I think it's, very generally applicable. So thanks again to the commissioners for allowing me to come and speak. It's my pleasure. I always warn people when I speak, their danger is getting me to shut up once I get started because I love talking about this so much, but thank you again for that opportunity. Thank you so much, Chris. That was really helpful. Uh, we love hearing about your experience. Um, as you said, this, this is your second time presenting for us, so we really appreciate you coming back. Um, well, thank you for having me back. Um, so that's, that's the end of our, the presentation portion of our meeting. Um, so now we're going to move on to our question and answer sessions and a panel discussion where we'll hear from uh, our, um, presenters again. Um, so I wanted to pause here for commissioner Houck, if you have any questions that you wanted to ask the presenters. Thank you, Emma. Yes. Um, so I wanted to go back to um this dr shulman's slide on i think it was 46 the last bullet that where he um, talked about some of the regulatory challenges and the puc might want to consider challenges in addition to the potential overlap of its own safety culture assessment to those of the office of energy infrastructure safety and he suggested you know looking at a public independent expert safety culture and SMS assessment unit tasked by both agencies to do assessments. And I wanted to hear a little bit more about his thoughts on that and pros and cons and what some of the other panelists um, may think of, of that concept. Oh, um, okay, I, I'd be happy to talk about that um, with, the, with the caveat that it's easy for me to recommend these things, but you know, you know better than I do what some of the difficulties are likely to be. I, I just feel that it's important um, that there be a source of knowledge about safety culture, safety management systems associated with the process of assessment. Um, right now, if the I gather that the uh, proposal is for an independent consultant to be hired by the uh, utility paid for by the utility, the CPUC will get the results. But I think it's helpful if the CPUC itself, I used to dream about this, about what the CPUC could be. If the CPUC was the repository of information about safety, safety management and improving safety, um, that that would help tremendously its own legitimacy in the eyes of the utilities and elsewhere. Um, but that's a difficult process, and um, you might, without it, you, in a sense, might have to hire another consultant to give you the validation or the 
uh, assessment of how good the original consultant's assessment was. But um, if you could if you could find a unit that would be independent, because I think the present day requirement is that you actually not do it yourself, do the assessment has to be an independent one. If you could find an independent group that could um, know a lot about safety culture uh, and the state of the art, so to speak, the state of practice, and um, then could be charged with doing some of these assessments, and um, that would make them seem, it's a, it's a form of collaboration in a way, because you are the regulator and the utility um, that's being regulated are both working with this third party independent expert unit. And those um, results might have some additional credibility. They're detached from the actual regulatory process in a sense. Um, and they're not um, beholden to the utility. The reason I mentioned the California Council of Science and Technology is I know they have access to expertise all over the state um, in universities and organizations. And so that might be a place where they could actually extend or create a unit to do this. Um, the difficulties of actually implementing this are, are no doubt very significant, and as I say, you will be the, more of an expert on those than, than I will. But this is just the idea I had in, in connection with your Herculean challenge of trying to do these assessments and then ultimately finding ways, and I, I think, again, Chris Hart's argument is right on point, find a way collaboratively to actually help the utilities improve their safety cultures. Thank you, and I don't know if any of the other panelists wanted to to comment on that, um, but I appreciate that that idea. Just in the uh, in the rail industry in the U.S., there is a um, a sort of in between part of that idea where there's a um, a short line safety institute who does safety culture assessments within the rail industry. And this is funded by the regulator and the regulator has involvement in it, but it's not uh, simplistic, it's not, um, uh, it's a joint industry regulator approach rather than a, um, a sort of totally regulator um, approach. So it's a, a joint industry uh, grouping who do the assessments and the in information is shared, but it's shared in a particular way. So that's another model you could look at the short line safety Institute, uh, which is for railways. Thanks. Another model that comes to mind for me is what the, what the info has started with nuclear power and that is peer reviews. Because that's, that's independent for sure. And it's, uh, it's, the, it's. People who are doing the assessments have credibility because they are, they are industry themselves. So, so that, that. Peer review program has proved to be so successful, even though it's voluntary. That that uh, I, I think that would be another way to get a, a good, valid assessment and have a trend line because they do repeat visits, and then they can uh, you know they can show how the trend is going. Thank you. Um, one other question. I think all, all of the panelists talked about. Looking at collaborative ways of working with industry regulators in some form or fashion, um, the airline example that um, that was provided um, by Christopher Hart in the last one um, was a really great example. Can you talk a little bit about um, how we could look at um, applying some of those ideas where we're focused on the system, but we also um, we're dealing with some of the issues that we have regarding the aging systems we're dealing with, um, the system hardening that may be needed, and some of the extreme weather and climate impacts that that we're looking at. So we've got you know what we're dealing with in real time, but needing to address these safety issues and transitioning from I think where you talked about looking at punishment to um, collaboration and looking at the system as a whole, how we can do that, looking at the electric and gas industries, if there's maybe some specific examples that um, you can 
provide in some of the work you've done with these other industries that you think would lend themselves particularly well to what we're trying to address here? In aviation, the uh, impetus was led by two champions. One champion was the head of the FAA, so the regulator was championing it, and also another champion was the vice president for safety at, at a major airline. So, so between the two of them, they were the ones who convinced everybody about the importance of showing up at the door and taking off their me first hat and coming to, to participate on a system-wide basis collaboratively rather than coming to see what they could get out of it. So, so I think it takes some champions that are placed in key positions to, to make that happen, to, to make people believe it. Because as Dr. Bradley said, if, the, if, if people don't believe, if they don't trust you, they don't believe that you're there for improvement, that you're instead they think you're there for enforcement, then you, you're obviously not going to get anywhere. So that, that to, to build that trust, what was very helpful in that was the two champions that, that the aviation had. And I'm convinced to this day that this collaboration would not have worked. A lot of regulators asked me, does the regulator need to be part of this? Because again, people are reluctant to show their show me their dirty laundry, but I, I don't think this collaboration would have had anywhere near that 80, 83% six, uh, improvement in the safety in the fatal accident rate if it had not been for the participation, active participation by the, by the uh, regulator. I might add as well that I think often when you're starting to move into this collaborative space, it can be helpful to take, you know, an, an individual topic. Like I, I think about us in, in Canada, there was an identification of issues around pipeline materials quality. And so a task force was struck and it was industry. Um, so our regulated entities, but also manufacturers who we don't actually regulate. Um, the regulator, of course, you know, brought everybody to the table. And it was, again, another opportunity to demonstrate in good faith that it was really about learning. And once you start to establish, I think, uh, you know, some, some trust in that space, you can open up and broaden those conversations. But I think often a singular topic that is emergent in terms of hazards, it can be a very good place to start. Okay, if um, none of the other panelists want to comment, I'll turn it back to Emma. I may have some additional follow up questions as we continue the discussion and have the audience discuss, but um, I do want to make sure we've got time uh, for those that are listening to ask questions. So I'll turn it back over to Emma. Great, thank you. Um, so we do have a panel discussion plan, but I wanted to pose one. We've only received one um, one question in the chat, so I wanted to pose that really quickly before we move on to the panel. Um, and this question is um, directed to Claudine, and it's um, can we ask or does CER have a developed set of questions for safety culture surveys that can be used by all to develop a benchmark across the industry? And this was posed by uh, Jay Carden from Southwest Gas. Uh, so, no, we do not have like an assessment, a list of assessment questions. We do not conduct assessments. Um, instead, what we've tried to do is develop tools that would allow um, our regulated entities to develop a, a plan of attack. I think um, Paul gave a very good description of the multi methods that should be employed, you know, for a really uh, comprehensive safety culture assessment. Um, what we do have is that suite of safety culture indicators and the statement on safety culture that has a, a pretty descriptive, um, uh, well, essentially a comprehensive description of the safety culture threats and defenses that are part of our framework. Um, and we know that some of our regulated entities have found those to be quite helpful in terms of trying to translate into signals that they might want to look for. Um, or approach with regards to their safety culture assessments. Um, if I could, I, I would also add um, at the end of my presentation is a, is a slide with uh, a whole variety of uh, guidance documents. A number of organizations, including the NRC, uh, have guidance documents on how to do safety culture, and they uh, get specific enough to actually have sample questions that could be asked um, in both an interview or in a questionnaire. And so you might want to look at those. The NRC has one. 
there's this independent uh, safety management, uh, um, aviation safety management collaboration group. They have a whole set of interview questions and strategies for doing interviews as part of a safety culture assessment. And then Chris Park sent around um, information. The Contra Costa County Safety Program also has a, gu a guidance document with a sample questionnaire. So you, you might want to uh, look at those for ideas of what a questionnaire actually would consist of. Great, thank you. Um, and just as a reminder, we, we do plan to share both the recording of this workshop and the slides so that um, all the first people that are attending here will be able to look through those links. Um, so we're gonna return to audience questions shortly, but um, we're gonna move on to our panel discussion. So we'll be, we'll be collecting questions in the chat. So feel free to continue to send those. Um, so um, I'm gonna pass it on to my colleague, Carolina Contreras to lead our panel discussion. Um, and I can share my screen really quickly to show you um, what the topic of this panel discussion is, and then I'll stop sharing my screen so that you all um, can see each other's faces as um, as you talk in the panel. Great, thank you, Emma. I hope everybody can hear me okay. Um, so for today's 30 minute panel, we are very fortunate to have a wealth of knowledge and diverse views from our experts on the topic of safety culture improvement. So. We hope to engage in a candid and thought-provoking discussion that can shed light on the benefits, challenges, paths, and decisions that the CPUC and our regulated utilities uh, will encounter as we begin the safety culture journey. So welcome panelists. Uh, to start off with our first question is related to what we as regulators, regulated utilities, and even the public need to know about um, an organization safety culture in order to make decisions and implement interventions. So to be more specific, uh, we understand that there are multiple approaches and models for assessing and understanding safety culture, some of which we heard about today. So there's uh, functionalist approaches that strive to engineer and quantify safety culture improvement. And then there's interpretive approaches that seek to understand underlying assumptions, beliefs, attitudes, and norms. Considering that the CPUC is exploring this topic for assessment of regulated gas and electric utilities, and that we operate in an environment that seeks tangible outcomes as proof of success, what, what do we need to know and measure about an organization's safety culture to identify issues and implement interventions that provide for long-term sustainable cultural improvement? So, why don't we start off with you, Dr. Fleming? I'm sorry to put you in the spotlight, but you were our first presenter today, so it makes sense. Um, welcome, and over to you, Dr. Fleming. Okay, um, so a couple of things to think about. I mean, I think the having looked at lots of different uh, industries globally uh, who've worked on safety culture, because it's been around for nearly 30 years, the biggest error that has been made to date is focusing on occupational safety measures and validating your uh, safety outcomes against occupational safety. The problem is that we, we, we're now pretty confident that there's a limited correlation between safety performance in an occupational safety domain and a um, process safety or major hazard risk domain. And uh, a lot of the early work that was done on safety culture, including work I have done myself, really we, we started to focus on having occupational injury as the major outcome measure mainly because we don't have good measures um, for uh, process safety. And, um, you know, the nuclear industry has shown us uh, how to do that, but very few other industries have done it well. So I think that's probably one of the big mistakes uh, that both the industry has made and often regulators fall into as well is focusing on things that have been associated with occupational safety and assuming that the same predictors uh, are related to uh, process safety. Um, and, you know, I think in terms of, of the approach, I think that, uh, you know, having a sophisticated understanding of how, how culture functions, I think is important, right? So it's, it's not just simply people having a positive attitude towards safety. Many of the um, organizations that have, have been involved in major disasters, the employees had very positive attitudes to safety before they happened. In fact, that might be a precursor to um, uh, 
an incident. So I, I think that um, having a more sophisticated uh, understanding, I think, is is important. Um, whether it's a functionalist um, or a more under, you know, I, I would sort of propose that uh, under trying to understand it is important and understand how those factors uh, impact uh, your your safety performance is probably more helpful rather than a more objectivist. Uh, we have a measure of X or Y. I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you, Dr. Fleming. We may uh, ask you to elaborate a little bit, but I think I'd love to also hear from uh, the other panelists. So, um, wonder if Dr. Cooper, since you have having some uh, trouble with video, I want to just check in with you real briefly. Uh, are you on the line? Maybe we'll uh, we'll we'll come back to Dr. Cooper shortly. Uh, and if you are on the line, Dr. Cooper, just uh, give us a sign. <laughs> um, so maybe I'll turn it over to Dr. Bradley. Um, like to hear some of your views uh, on our path and just this topic in general. Um, over to you, Dr. Bradley. Um, I think I might uh, add to to Mark's comments. One of the things that we noted as we started to move into the space when we would talk with industry um, was this real desire to operationalize and I'll that in air quotes operationalize safety culture. And when we would have conversations about exploring what that actually meant, it often meant driving the responsibilities, the accountabilities in the assessments very much to the frontline worker, as opposed to really evaluating the decisions, the values, the incentives uh, that were coming from the top of the organization and signaling what was important and, and what was you know, socially acceptable within that organization. So um, again, this is probably you know, what not to do as opposed what to what to do. Um, but that's something that I would keep front of mind. Um, this is, as we have heard and seen from the presentations, a very difficult task. Um, it is a, a concept and a construct and, you know, everyone wants to make it as tangible as possible. And I find that there's a real strong desire to make it easy to measure. And with that, it tends to get pushed down to you know, what are the um, attitudes and even the actions of the frontline worker as opposed to uh, those in the C-suite who are making ultimate decisions about the direction of the organization, which of course filter down through the multiple layers of that organization. And ultimately, you know, we have seen, and I think it was described earlier, there's very few instances where we have rogue employees. Everyone is actually trying to do the right thing, but there are very strong and also say strong, but also nuanced signals that come from uh, those key decision makers in an organization. And so I would, you know, recommend that you not fall into that, that place of, of trying to operationalize and push this down uh, to the, the to the the working uh, level. Thank you, Dr. Bradley. That's very helpful um, insight to share. Uh, want to check in with uh, Dr. Shulman and Mr. Hart. Uh, Dr. Shulman, uh, do you have some insight to be able to share with us? Well, uh, the first insight is you've asked the $24,000 questions. <laughs> Those are very difficult questions to answer. <laughs> um, you know, what to look at, how to look at it. Um, I would just say, again, there are some interesting um, documents that you could consult. Chris mentioned INPO. INPO has developed a, uh, what it calls the traits of healthy, in their case, nuclear, but in general, safety cultures. Those traits are elaborated into attributes and examples and even questions to ask. So you might wanna just look at what they think are really important issues in the plants that they their members run. Um, and the other thing is, I would look for people who have worked in really successful organizations that did have really strong safety cultures and uh, talk to them. What, what do they think were the most important things that helped them develop or maintain a good safety culture in their organizations? Um, and I'm sure you can find the chemical process uh, industry has process safety people who are working in oil and gas. 
um, mainly pipelines, but also oil and gas in general. Um, some of those people have long experience in organizations that actually did function very well. Could give you a lot of insight, I think, practically speaking, into what it is you need to know and need to think about and how you might determine it uh, with respect to what elements of a safety culture are really important and what you should be focusing on. Thank you, Dr. Shulman. Uh, clearly, this is a, a very big bite and a big challenge we have to contend with, and um, I appreciate your insight. I'm curious if um, Mr. Hart uh, has any feedback to share with us on uh, this topic, um, and happy to repeat it for you, uh, Mr. Hart, if it's useful. So, I think you're mute. Actually, not very much. I won't have much guidance on that because most of my experience involves looking at the safety of the of the on an industry wide level as opposed to an organizational level. And our struggle there is, as you've heard several people say, I think Dr. Fleming first mentioned that you're not going to measure safety by how many accidents you didn't have, so to speak. And so, so we fortunately in aviation we have so few accidents that that looking at the number of accidents, all that tells you is it's kind of warm, getting warmer or kind of cool, getting cooler versus we're, we're at 71 going 72 or 71 going to 70. We, we, we're, so the struggle in aviation is to figure out how to get more granular. And that's one of the reasons that they're using collecting and using so much data is so they can get much more granular than just accidents in order to have a, a, a better sense of, of what's going on. So, so I think that uh, the, I, I, I'm not sure how applicable that is at, a, at an organizational level, but that's, that's what we're trying to do at an industry wide level is to, uh, is to look at the, the finer, the more granular data so that we can get a better picture of, of uh, it, cause, so we're not just relying on how many accidents that we have. Thank you, Mr. Hart. Um, I realize that perhaps the focus on uh, singular organization is probably a one-off effort and uh, probably CPC is looking industry-wide as well. So all those industry-wide insights, I think, are useful for our agency and our regulated utilities, so appreciate it. Um, and let me just uh, quickly check back on uh, Dr. Cooper. Uh, Dr. Cooper, are you there and can you hear us? Mm, sounds like we've lost him. Uh, I will check back with him again. Uh, so we actually have time for uh, maybe one or two more questions. Uh, but let me check back on everybody. Is there any uh, reaction or any additional information that anybody uh, wants to share? And just feel free to jump in to any of the panelists uh, surrounding the what we need to know, what we need to measure uh, in order to make decisions about safety culture. I, I would just want to add that one of the so a lot of the work that's been done on safety culture up to relatively recently has focused a lot on the perceptions of employees. And when we started that, that was a good plan because broadly speaking in many industrial contexts, like offshore and gas, um, the employees had had pretty negative perceptions of how safety was being managed and they were able to identify lots of weaknesses uh, in the system. One of the things that's a little bit unusual for pipelines in particular, um, and maybe it's just that I've been exposed to them in the last decade rather than previously, is that they tend to have worryingly positive perceptions um, around um, uh, the, how safety has been managed in their industry and um, are maybe atypical from other industries that I've, I have worked with. Um, and the American Gas Association does a regular um, perceptual survey and it actually um, has very, very positive results across the board um, you know, 80, 90% uh, positive perceptions. And I think that um, one needs to be very cautious about that. So negative perceptions can be useful and provide insight. Positive perceptions um, could be deceptive. So it, it may seem like it's very concrete, but um, relying on perceptions and those perceptions can be gathered through a questionnaire. Those perceptions can be gathered through focus groups. But if you're relying solely on perceptions, or primarily on perceptions, 
that can be somewhat um, a deceptive approach. And that's why the uh, nuclear industry recommends a much more comprehensive assessment methodology, um, which includes document analysis, uh, observation, um, interviews and focus groups. So I, I think that's just one thing to have a, a warning sign out there that if you think positive safety culture equals positive perceptions, uh, then I think um, it's not going to give you useful data. Another variation on that theme is something else Dr. Fleming mentioned, which is complacency. So that's one of the struggles we're having in aviation. And I'm convinced that complacency played a big role in the MAX situation, because I think when you're as safe as that industry is, you go that, that long with, with only one fatality, that leads to complacency. And I'm talking about complacency on both sides, the FAA, the regulator, and Boeing, the manufacturer. And I think that caused them to miss weak signals that they would have been paying more attention to if they hadn't been more complacent. So that goes to the perception notion that, that uh, you know, and, and again, goes to why we want to find more granular ways to measure our safety, because we find that when things get very, very safe by the macro measures, then complacency rears its ugly head. I would add to that, Chris, for the pipeline industry, that there can be a, another form of that complacency where you're perceived to be better than other industry players. So being the best of a bad lot can make you feel like you're brilliant, when actually in a global context, you're not that good, right? You know, and um, I think that plays off a lot in, in particularly pipelines, because you've got some small pipeline companies who don't have very sophisticated systems, and then you've got some really big players who compared to the small ones look super, but actually in reality are pretty poor. Um, and I, I, so I think that that is exactly the same um, in the sense that aviation was a global industry was doing really well. Um, and Boeing in particular, super, super safe company in many, many ways. I think they started to become, have a sense of invulnerability, uh, which I think is, uh, is, is, a, is a key threat uh, to many safety critical industries. By the way, I would say that complacency itself is one of the uh, signals, one of the precursors in a good safety culture. In some of the organizations we looked at, they were always worried about complacency. And in fact, as I mentioned, they were always determined to understand that they were only as reliable as the first accident and out ahead. They didn't look at past records at all. And, and in one sense, when uh, Kathy Sutcliffe and Carl White wrote their book about managing the unexpected. They interpreted it as a preoccupation with failure. Well, I don't, I don't think that's a little overstated that they have a preoccupation with failure, but nonetheless, they are really um, running scared as managers, the, the ones we interviewed, about just how much they did know. And every meeting which we attended when somebody's talking about planning a work planning session or tailboard for doing work, Somebody will ask the question, what are we leaving out? What are we not thinking about? So in, in a way, those kind of attitudes are an indicator of a strong safety culture from our from my perspective. And so um, to the degree that people are caught up in, in the success that they've had in the past, they are not thinking appropriately with respect to maintaining safety in their operations. Well, that's true. When somebody says, yeah, we got this safety problem figured out, that's when you need to really be worried. Yeah, right. Um, I was going to add a note uh, to that issue of kind of benchmarking and comparing uh, against uh, your peers. It's one of the worries that I have about the potential quantification of the uh, safety culture where, you know, I, I certainly have seen it in, in other realms where you get your scorecard and then you compare yourself and that I think can actually facilitate complacency and a, a sense of comfort about where you are. And it can be, as Mark says, you know, deceptive. So it's one of the things that I think about uh, when, when I see scorecards for safety culture, it always leaves me with a, a sense of unease about the unintended consequences of quantifying something uh, like this construct and the messages that it can send and how it can be utilized and perhaps misinterpreted um, by organizational leaders. Thank you. Uh, I, I think this is such, and please, uh, I think that was Dr. Fleming, please go ahead. Yeah. 
I, I just, just to sort of illustrate this, you know, there's been talk about maturity models and I came up with the safety culture maturity model and, and coined that term back in 1999. And I did it in, in a pub with um, a guy called Bob Miles, who worked for the UK Health and Safety Executive at the time. But the purpose of coming up with the maturity model was to illustrate to people the, the difficulty in, in assessing safety culture and that our, it was to, to illustrate that it was all ballpark that we were doing, that there was no real precision in the assessment approaches. And it sort of concerns me now that we're now using those maturity models as measurement tools, which is not really the intention. It was just to say safety culture, our understanding of it is in a ballpark sense. We don't have a lot of precision. We know what bad looks like. We know what good maybe looks like um, in a general sense. And we know what medium is. And that's sort of what we were trying to describe rather than giving a sense that we have culture X or Y. We have a generative culture. And, you know, for me, uh, when I hear that, um, uh, it makes me quite concerned that, you know, people are, are so we've achieved this level rather than it's sort of a reflecting of, of the way way of thinking about things. And maybe just to illustrate the process rather than something as, as definitive and as and as hard and fast as it may appear uh, to people. Yeah, just a, a quick thing on this. I think um, I, I actually tried to answer a question about um, maturity models. And uh, I think they actually can be very valuable, especially if they incorporate a variety of variables in trying to assess the state, not just a few. They obviously will want to use some quantitative, but also descriptive variables, uh, interviews and observations. And they use ordinal scales and do not attempt interval comparisons across utilities. Um, at best, a safety um maturity model should be thought of as intervals as rather ordinals but not that you can actually precisely pin down where they are relative relative to those categories that would be a real mistake a false precision dr bradley and um Mr. Hart, do, do either of you have any thoughts on the application of maturity models from your industries or from your past experience? At a very high level, um, I guess I would say that, uh, as I mentioned before, if somebody says, yeah, we got this one all figured out, then uh, you know you're in trouble. But a, a, a variation on that theme is when, when people are, are thinking that, uh, uh, this is a this is a safety is a destination rather than a journey. That's a problem, you know, because you'll never reach it. That's that's one of the issues that I'm going to be talking about actually this afternoon on the 737 Max is that when they look at approving the airplane, they approve it based on compliance. And I'm thinking that may have worked in the in the past, but you're going to have to go beyond compliance and talk about safety. So so you know when, when people are are thinking, yeah, we've reached this destination. That's certainly a, a danger sign and I, I, I would uh, anybody who's satisfied okay we got compliance we're done as opposed to well here, here's what we need to, need to do to be safe that's that's a challenge yeah thank you i i would i would just say that i think the maturity models can sometimes be helpful and really just kind of illustrating um, that continuum, but certainly I wouldn't suggest they be utilized for any form of measurement um, or, or metrics, as I noted earlier. You've got people doing the right thing, even when somebody's not looking, that's a real good sign. Well, there's certainly a, a lot of major themes that I think we're taking away from our discussion today. And um, I think there was is one last question that we wanted to pose briefly. Um, so, because we only have a few minutes, I, we just wanted to get uh, your perspectives and your views on how to enact change and how to make it sustainable. Um, what do we need to know about that as we embark on this journey? And I understand that a lot of our questions are pretty large and pretty loaded, uh, but I hope you appreciate that that's essentially the the journey that we're at and that those are the, the crossroads that we find ourselves in. Um, so happy 
to leave you. Anybody wants to jump in, please go ahead. Or I can call out on somebody. Um, let me just check on Dom again. Dom, are you are you on the line, Dr. Cooper? I, I do think we've lost uh, Dom. So uh, perhaps uh, I'm going to call on you, uh, Dr. Schulman, uh, since uh, you are in the middle of my screen. I was afraid you might do that. Um, so uh, enacting change in organizations is very difficult, especially from a regular regulator's perspective. And in, when you're talking about safety culture, this intangible abstraction, it's doubly, triply difficult. I would say, though, I would say this. If you, if you are, as a regulator, determined to start moving your regulation ahead in the direction of safety culture, its assessment, and its promotion, the first place to look at change is in yourselves, your own safety culture, um, your own safety management approach. Um, and and what would it take for your organization to actually engage collaboratively in with the utilities in developing good effective assessment processes that to me is a first step in getting an idea of what's going to be required for success in this area so i would say Look to yourselves and to see what just what it would take to make sure that you have elements of the safety cultures that we've talked about, that we've described, and that actually you have a way to truly engage collaboratively, almost on, an, on a research and development basis with the utilities in developing the methods and metrics for assessing. I, I would comment back. on that and say the key word, as I mentioned before, is collaboration, because that, when you talk about change, there's a good chance that any change you make in a complex system is going to have changes throughout the system. And that's where collaboration is so crucial to have all of those participants from throughout the system involved in making that change. Because if, if it affects people who weren't involved in designing the change, it's probably not going to be successful. Thank you, um, Mr. Hart. I I believe that Claudine, you had uh, some thoughts to share. Yeah, I, I was going to note um, to Paul's comment. I think the the thing for a regulator to realize is, is that there there is no quick fix here, <laughs> um, and this is a considerable investment. So I think it really comes down to having a very realistic picture of what um moving in this space looks like particularly if there's going to be assessments conducted i mean they are incredibly labor intensive i think if they're you know deemed to have any you know good degree of validity um and i i agree with the you know looking at yourselves um i think that one of the things that we often do as regulators with you know good intentions is we see a problem we seek to solve that problem we often don't step back and think about the unintended consequences of our actions. And it's one of the things that I think we at the CR are getting better at doing. Um, but it, it really is looking at, you know, these emergent issues um, through the traditional lens, but then stepping back and asking the questions around what are we missing and what could we be introducing into the system by these actions? How could they potentially be manipulated intentionally or otherwise, but you know, how could we potentially be introducing a threat into the system, even though we have very good intentions as the regulator? Yeah, I mean, I would agree with all of that. I mean, I think the collaborative approach that uh, Chris and Claudine have both described is, is definitely a, a, a place to, 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 to uh, work at. I would think sometimes it might be helpful for you as a as a CPUC to sort of do a bit of a thought experiment in terms of what are you trying to achieve, you know, and, and what might that look like, right? So my my guess is you're probably trying to avoid 
um, major incidents, major failures. So you want to be able to identify those beforehand. Well, what would that look like and what sort of information would we would we need to be collecting and, and to be able to do that? And what sort of management approach do we want our our industry leaders to have? Right. So maybe that's that's a place to sort of think about it in terms of well, what, what are we trying to achieve? And, and another way to sort of think about it is, you know, the metaphor that I mentioned earlier, which is, you know, you know, thinking of safety culture a bit like love. Right. So maybe you as the regulator, you're trying to achieve a situation where 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 a couple um, love each other, right? And you know it's quite difficult for you to impose that right on on an entity, right? And I think that's the thing that's tricky. It's something that maybe you can create a context where that can grow. Also, you know there might be indicators where we could say these are associated with a couple who love each other, but actually. Um, if you turn those indicators into performance measures, then they would no longer work, right? So maybe a couple spends time together. Maybe they go out on dates together. Maybe they set, give each other gifts. But if you come up with a list of 20 things that couples who love each other do and say, that's our performance measure of love, then very quickly it would become very hollow, right? You know, so I think that there's, there's a sort of sense in which just stepping out and thinking a bit more clearly of, or, or being clear about, well, what is it we're trying to achieve? What can we do and maybe what what can't we do? So I would say what you can do is impose a, a safety culture on an organization and say, you must have this safety culture. I don't think you're planning to do that, but I don't think you could even if you wanted. And then if you're saying, well, we're going to have them assess it, that's fine. But then what do they do with it? Right. So a, a company constantly assessing themselves and identifying failures. Is that a bad thing or is it a good thing? Right. You know, so I think there's some things about thinking about what we're trying to achieve here, which I think would be helpful as well. Um, the idea of requiring uh, uh, duty holders to conduct assessments and we evaluating those assessments seems good. And the, there's definitely regulators who do that and um, have had some benefit from it. Um, the challenge becomes, how are we part of this process and how do we get a sense that this is leading to improvement? The example I would give you is BP prior to Deepwater Horizon had safety culture assessment results and they were all good right and that did not protect, prevent that disaster from happening so i think there's a bit about the quality of the assessment and also how you use those results for improvement that becomes the challenge from a regulator's perspective We are actually out of time, but I'm very deeply appreciative of all of your feedback and input. I think um, we we missed uh, getting Dom's uh, input, but I um, I do appreciate the themes. The uh, collaboration is highlighted uh, through all all of your presentations. Uh, also, the challenges and the nuances of connecting um, outcomes and indicators. Uh, but uh, I think we have a, a very challenging and interesting road ahead and uh and i hope that in some way we will all be able to uh, tap into your knowledge in the future in some ways and just help each other as we progress in this journey um with that i will hand it to emma back to emma for our q a session uh so thank you all again and uh over to you emma thanks so much carolina for um leading that panel discussion um so for the for our next session, we're just going to take um, questions from the audience, and there's a few ways that we can do that. So you can either type your questions into the use the question and answer function, or if you look towards the bottom of your screen, you'll see like a small hand um, at the bottom, um, which you can use to raise your hand, like to ask a question directly. Um, so we have received one question, so I can just read that read that out for now to get us started and it's from chris parks and it says given what you have shared and heard what specifically do you believe the cpuc should prioritize and do regarding operator safety culture in california um, so that seems open to various panelists and um, maybe i'll pass it to dom since he he's he's back with us now uh, so dr cooper if you wanted to answer that first Sorry about your technical difficulties. Oh. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. 
You can hear me. Yes, good now. We can oh, hear you. Cool. That loud. Okay. Um, if you can repeat that question, uh, so what should the CPUC be focusing on? Um, I think was the question in terms of relation to safety culture. I think, um, and it's responding to some of the things that were said earlier that I could hear but couldn't respond to, was the C-suite. Uh, I think it was Dr. Shulman was talking about the C-suite, and that's exactly where, uh, or sorry, um, Claudine was talking about the C-suite. And everything that we've been trying to do with safety culture is definitely at that level and trying to get the senior managers to pull the levers into the organization that create the right situation, which then impacts on the guy's behavior when they're out on, on the operational side of things. So that's really what it is. And the ethos there very quickly is optimize the situation to optimize the behavior. In terms of the outputs, I noticed that the IOU, with its suite of outcomes, measures something like 23 different process safety uh, type of incidents versus eight um, individual uh, personal injury statistics. But the report from SEMPRA said that there was an emphasis on uh, personal safety. So I think there's a bit of a contradiction there with the outcomes of an assessment looking at assumptions versus what the actual facts are saying. And I've heard a lot about how the maturity models aren't intended for this, that, and the other, and how the uh, quantification of safety culture is not a good idea. And I would suggest to you that um, there's another way of looking at that, and that's to say that when you quantify your safety culture and you validate it, by going back against your incident and output statistics or performance uh, measures, whether they're leading and lagging, that that gives you a very good strong sense of your safety culture and the accuracy. If you use multiple regressions, it will sift out and tell you which of the core features that you need to be looking at, whether that would be safety leadership, whether that would be safety communications, whether that would be lessons learned, just culture or whatever. The tools that you use are simply those. They are tools. The tools allow you to identify or conduct diagnosis of the issues. And if it's what those results tell you is what the IOUs need to be focusing on. There's no predetermined things per se. I will say that if you, and I, I did hear what Mark said about perceptions, and I think he was exactly right that if you get overly strong perceptions, that's not necessarily a good thing. But equally with the assumptions, these assumptions are invisible. Nobody knows what these assumptions are. They are determined by the assessors. And the assessors test the validity of those by asking the person who told them all the information whether they agree with them or not. And that's as described by, by Frank Goldemond in his thesis. So. For me, it's a bit of a problem. And in terms of quantification, I think if you get your measures right, and I agree that there's a lot of quantifiable measures that aren't correct, but if you get your measures right, and you get the right process, and you get uh, people being truthful, then the quantification is not a problem. When you've got benchmark data, and as I said, I've been at this for 30 years, a little bit longer than Mark, and we've got benchmark data from around the globe for different industries. And whenever we've presented any type of maturity model data, and we use that benchmark data, which is on percentiles, and when you use that and the, the companies don't get upset, they look at that and say, hmm, looks like we've got a way to go, or we're slightly behind our peers, or we're slightly ahead of our peers. But I think it's correct, and I think Dr. Shulman said, if you think you've got to the end of your journey, you've got a real problem, and I don't disagree with that. James Reason made that point many, many years ago. So the answer to the question, and I'm sorry I've been a little bit long-winded here, but the answer to the question is whatever your assessment tells you, and, then, and it's what your validated assessment tells you, because you have to correlate, or you have to find alternative data to validate the responses that you're getting so that it's not all just 
perception or opinion, that it's actually predicated on fact. And I think that's key and something for the CPUC to really consider because quantification is a good way of going and peer-reviewed publications that we've published over the years on doing so uh, would suggest that it's a good, robust way of doing it. And there's a lot involved. You have to make sure that your, your performance data is reliable. And there's a whole set of suite of metrics that go with that to make sure that is the case so that you can defend it. So I, I would really urge the CPUC to consider that the quantification is the right way, there's ways of doing it, that doesn't preclude any other methodology that goes in there. If you want to do um, interviews, and again, they can be, as I said, turned into percentage scores. If you want to use surveys, that's fine. They can be put on um, percentage scores, so you can standardize your, your output measure, as it were. Behavioral observations can go on percentage scores. System audit scores can, can be turned and converted into percentages. Um, site visits and what you see there. So there's, there's lots of different ways of doing this, but it doesn't preclude any particular methodology. This is not a competition about what's the best way of doing this and what's not the best way of doing this. This is about how do you get to the data that tells you where you need to improve so you avoid process safety incidents and you avoid hurting people and you certainly avoid uh, the stakeholders i.e the public in california suffering the results um so that's what it's about and uh, it's all been talked about in terms of collaboration i think is brilliant and i think that if everyone approaches this with this aim of collaboration instead of competition, because the differences that there are between all of these different approaches is actually quite minute. The only real difference is whether you quantify or you don't. There's ways and means of doing it, and they're useful. Yes, they can have unintended consequences, but if you're aware of what those are, then you can put in mitigating factors to make sure that they don't become a problem. So, you know, I'm quite bemused by some of the responses, but then equally, except that there's all different ways of doing it. Everyone's been at different ways of doing this for the last 30 years. I think, as Mark quite rightly said, the, f the field has got far more sophisticated in the, what it's looking at, the way that it operates. And, I mean, I've seen things when we did our one with the cultural web. That, that entity, there was an awful lot of fatalities involved in, in that industry. When we finished and we did all the quantification and we did all the multiple regressions and we and we finished it, a year later, this, these people had the best results they've ever had and the death rate had gone away. So it's very much about your, your, your purpose, your focus and your execution. And whatever tools you've got at your disposal, if they work for you, then use them. But don't throw the baby out with the bathwater is what I would suggest. And I would very strongly urge the use of quantification alongside all the other methods. Uh, and I think I'll probably just leave it there because I'm hogging all the time. So I apologize for that. So uh, I would just like to briefly respond. So I think there's a couple of issues. Um, a lot of the methodologies that you've talked about, uh, Dr. Cooper, are related to occupational safety outcomes. And the challenge about quantification and using multiple regression in a context where we've got very poor measures of uh, process safety, I think is one of the fundamental issues we run into with this uh, idea. I think that while um, uh, quantification uh, may have its role focusing exclusively um, from a quantitative uh, approach and just trying to simplify things, um, uh, tends to um, result in poor outcomes uh, in the longer term in terms of uh, improvements uh, to safety performance and actually contributes more to uh, an illusion of um, uh, safety culture improvement. Um, you've mentioned a lot of uh, Dr. Goodman's work and I can be pretty confident that he wouldn't agree with much of what you've said. Um, so I think Having worked in this space for a long time, having started in a very much quantitative uh, approach um, over the years, 
I use a much more blended approach where you need to be able to uh, understand um, and capture the, the documentation information that you can and, and quantify that where relevant. But um, having a more nuanced view of culture is definitely what I would uh, recommend to CPUC. Uh, and I would be very uh, concerned about some of the downside risk of adopting a quantitative approach leading you to have an overconfident view of how well the organizations are dealing with um, safety. Sorry, Mark, dare I say you're making an awful lot of assumptions there. Um, excuse the pun. Uh, I mean, I, the cultural web is both qualitative and quantitative. So you have the richness, you have the understanding, and you have the quantification. You can, it, it, it's how you approach the task. It's how the, the different measures that you put in front of people. So it's not a case of saying, no quants is good, quants is bad. It's about case of saying, what's the instruments that you're using? How good are those instruments? Are they based on sound scientific research? And yes, Frank and I have had discussions and we've attended symposiums and together with many of the other safety culture gurus around the globe um, with these things and discussing these issues. And there's a place for each. We don't say that there isn't. Um, the, in terms of the use of the quantification, well, that depends upon how it's presented and what the data is telling you. And I mean, I've actually uh, come away from. Sorry, Dom. I'm going to interrupt yeah. you just because we're at we're at time. Um, I hope that we'll be Thanks. able to discuss this in uh, in our um, in our technical working group meetings, which I expect will have a lot to do with this measurement question. So I wanted to just give a final pause. Uh, we did have one question we didn't get to, but we'll send it to panelists after. Um, and I wanted to pause to make sure that Commissioner Houck, if you had any closing thoughts or comments, or if any of the panelists had any closing thoughts or comments, uh, you have the opportunity to provide those. I, I just really wanted to thank the panelists for the discussion today. This is um, a top priority for the commission and sharing your expertise and the thoughts that you did today um, has been very helpful for me. I learned a lot from the discussion and I look forward to um, looking at how we can incorporate these concepts into our, our rulemaking and reevaluating and looking at how we think about safety culture as we're going forward. So just wanted to thank all of you for your participation today. Um, and I will turn it back over to Emma. Thank you so much, Commissioner Houck. Um, and thank you for all of our panelists for presenting today. Um, thank you for Carolina for leading our panel discussion, for Eric for helping us keep on time, uh, and again, to Commissioner House for your leadership on this proceeding. Um, and we will, Noel will follow up with the panelists to get you an answer to your question. Um, and we'll be in touch with um, the, the slides and the recording for this uh, presentation. Um, thank you again and have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you. Yeah, thanks again. Thank you for the opportunities. Thank you.